All scripture quotations are taken from the King James Version of the Holy Bible. Becoming a Vessel of Honor Part 1 Chapter 1 to 9 Becoming a Vessel of Honor in the Master Service Father, in the name of Jesus, I humbly come before your throne to make a petition. I am very well aware of my own helplessness apart from you. I know the words on the pages of this book are worthless unless you do the work. Therefore, I reverently ask you to send forth the Holy Spirit with each book to work in power in the minds and hearts of every reader. May the blessed Holy Spirit do his work in spite of the frailties of this book. May he bring understanding to the readers and plant within their hearts a hunger and thirst for an ever-deepening knowledge of yourself and the riches that are in Christ Jesus. May all power and glory and honor be unto you forever and ever. In the precious name of Jesus I ask these things. Amen, Rebecca. Come in. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. 2 Timothy 2 19 21. Forward. I have known Rebecca Brown for quite a long time and have always found her very inspirational and challenging. It has been my privilege to work with her in several deliverances and see people set free from demonic bondage through the power of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. I believe that Rebecca is a servant of God. She has been used by God in the past, is still being used by God to reveal truths that need to be shared in this present age and will continue to be used by God until he sees fit to call her home to her heavenly reward. I have worked more than 25 years in the ministry of God's Word. I have checked what Rebecca teaches with scripture and I am satisfied that she is very accurate and knowledgeable. It would do well for Christians to pay attention to the message that God has given to her to share. The problem with our modern generation of Christians is that we too often want to hide our heads and pretend that the things that are going on in society are not really there. We want to feel that things are just like they used to be and that the world is getting better. The fact is that Satan and his forces have stepped up their activities as they try to get ready for a world takeover that is predicted in scripture. Things are not as they used to be. Demonic powers are at work in this generation with more force, fervor, and openness than ever before. The Christian who finds himself asleep to what is going on will someday regret his decision to hide from the facts and not prepare. Rebecca is one of God's servants who is sounding the alarm to the church to awaken. I thank God that Rebecca has had the courage to speak up in spite of opposition, persecution, and ignorance on the part of those who should be helping herald the message of the end times. It would do well if the Christian world would quit picking and bickering at each other and work together to reach a harvest of souls for Jesus. Read what Rebecca has to say. Compare it to what is revealed in God's Word. Then. Be ready to act in doing your part to reach a world that Christ died to save. It seems to me that prayer and obedience to God will go a lot farther in fulfilling Christ's great commission than will gossip and schism among God's people. If the church doesn't wake up soon and stop pretending that nothing is changing and that time will go on forever, we are going to be the victims and God will say, I sent my servants to warn you, but you would not listen, God's. People were asleep when Christ came the first time and they missed that wonderful event. The church is asleep again, it seems like we will never learn. Thank you, Rebecca for waking us. Rev. William W. Woods. Church of the Nazarene Stevenson, Washington. Introduction. I did not want to write this book. I do not want to publish this book. In fact, just recently, I have strenuously petitioned the Lord to release me from doing speaking engagements. You see, I had what I thought were very good reasons. That is, until the Lord straightened me out. In the past few years, the antagonism against me within the Christian community has escalated. I am hated by so many. Newsletters are being printed all over the place supposedly exposing me. Lies and false accusations are flying, especially through the Christian bookstores, by letters and word of mouth amongst Christians. Not once has anyone printing a newsletter contacted me to find out if there might be another side to the story. Rarely does any Christian stop to contact me to see if what is being said is true. If you stop to think that Satan usually destroys people by framing them and setting up all sorts of accusations against them, which is what happened to me. In fact, I have discovered that many Christians love gossip above everything. 
they justify it to themselves by calling their lies exposing the truth. But, what really brought everything to a head is some contacts my husband and I have had recently from some people in very high positions within Satan's kingdom. They said, we really do not have to spend much time or effort in trying to destroy the Christians anymore. They are so busy stabbing each other in the back and destroying each other that we no longer have to worry about them. We hear what you are saying, but we cannot see any advantage in choosing to serve your God. The servants of your God are no different than us. In fact, most of them are worse than us. At least we do have some code of honor. They have none, as far as we can see. Your God is a weak God. He must be to tolerate with what is going on in his own kingdom. I was heartbroken. I have had such an incredible burden for the salvation of these people for so long. My tears flowed, but my horror grew as I tried to share my grief with another Christian in a public ministry. You can't let that bother you, he said. You can't listen to them. After all, they are just Satanists. They lie. I spent days in tears and prayer. What was the use? So many Christians do not even care if their lives are driving others away from Christ, and don't seem to want to listen or to know what is happening in the real world. Truly this scripture is fulfilled in my own life. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents, and brethren, and kinfolk, and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Luke 21 16. O oh Lord, I begged. Please release me and let me shake the dust of the organized Christian churches off of my feet and go out into the highways and byways to the heathen who have never even heard of you. That is where my heart longs to be silence. Finally, one day about a month ago, as I was watching the sun come up with the Lord, he spoke to me so very clearly. Child, I am God. Yes, Father, I know you are God, I replied. The simple statement came again. Child, I am God, I sat thoughtfully a minute. Well Lord, I must be missing something. What am I missing about the fact that you are God? The thoughts poured in from the Holy Spirit both convicting me and giving me a blessed hope at the same time. They went something like this. You have been petitioning me to release you from speaking to my people to warn them that they must put sin out of their lives so that they will be prepared to stand in the coming persecution. I will not release you from this command for I am a just and holy God. I have said in my word. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4 17. The end of the age is near. This country will fall. But, because judgment begins in my house, my people will be persecuted before the unbelievers will suffer. Therefore, you and others must go forth and warn my people first. As I was sitting soberly thinking about that, the Lord spoke to me again. Do not despise my people. You are falling into the trap. Tell me, if I had moved in judgment upon you for your gossip and backstabbing 15, Years ago, where would you be today? I would be in a terrible position, was my immediate answer. Do not forget, I am not only a God of holiness and justice, I am also a God of mercy. It is in mercy that I tarry, waiting for my people to repent of the evil they are doing. Satan has no mercy at all. In fact, Satan has always interpreted mercy as being weakness. His people follow a certain code of honor because there is no mercy in Satan's kingdom. If they disobey that code they are dead. It is that simple. Therefore, Satan's servants think that mercy is a sign of weakness. But I tell you that I display the greatest power I have ever displayed when I allowed my only son, Jesus, to be tortured and killed upon a cruel cross. My mercy paid the price for your sins. Always remember, I love my people. Even though they are prideful, sinful, and even destroy my servants. I still love them and wait in mercy for them to repent for their wrongdoing. They will answer to me for what they are doing one day. The blood of many will be required of them at the judgment seat of Christ but, do not despise my people because I love them. See 1 Corinthians 3 13 15, Romans 14 10. I repented for the anger I felt towards others at the terrible testimony they were giving to the world. But my heart was still heavy. What can I say to those who have been stumbled by the sins of Christians? Lord. How can I effectively bring them to Jesus? I asked. Once more, that simple yet sublime statement was fluttered into my mind and heart. Child, I am God. It is your responsibility to share the good news with these people, to tell them about Jesus Christ. 
It is my responsibility to prove myself to them. You cannot prove me to anyone. Only I can do that. You tell the good news, then you pray, and you challenge them to pray and ask me to make myself real to them. The rest is up to me. Praise the Lord. How true it is. We human beings cannot prove God to anyone. God himself must, and will do that. We are responsible to preach the gospel to all men. God will do the rest. Hallelujah. What a wonderful God we serve. I have no need to defend myself. The Lord is my defender. Why should I run around trying to defend myself when I have done nothing wrong? Those who will listen will listen, and those who will gossip will gossip. It is my prayer that all Christians everywhere will heed the warning the Lord has given to me and to others in His service. A persecution is fast sweeping down upon us in this land. I pray that you, His child, will be prepared to stand strong, bringing glory to this wonderful God of ours. Stand strong in the power of Jesus Christ, God, Almighty, bringing glory to God the Father forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 1. Testing the Covenant. The shadows lengthened in the cold dusk as the sun began to slip quickly below the horizon of mountains of barren rock. Winter twilight lasts only a few minutes up in the high desert where Elaine and Rebecca lived. This particular evening of December 21, 1988, the wind was stilled and everything seemed to be hushed, waiting for the events of that night. Evil stalks, always, under the cover of darkness. This night was of particular significance because December 21st is the night of the winter solstice, a high day for the Satanists. This particular day was also to be the day of the death of Elaine and Rebecca. Once again the age-old battle lines were being drawn, the forces of Satan against the forces of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's most recent covenant with Rebecca was about to be tested, see Prepare for War Chapter 2, Covenanting with God in Chapter 7, Hearing God. The 1st of December, 1988, God had covenanted with Rebecca, giving her his promise that the valley in which they lived would be a haven for people coming out of Satanism. The Lord directly promised her the lives of everyone coming under her care or working with her in the ministry. He told Rebecca she would have many battles and some close calls but in the end, their lives would be saved. Shortly, they were to see the mighty arm of God warring against Satan on their behalf. As darkness fell, Rebecca went around and re-anointed and sealed their home. The warm lights from the windows shone out in stark contrast against the dark, cold evil outside. All was still as dark figures began to gather on the edge of the property. Rebecca and Elaine's home was in a country-type area with a yard of a little more than an acre. Sheba, their dog, began to pace the floor from one room to another with a continuous low growl in her throat. This was her warning signal of danger on the property. But everyone in the house already sensed the growing evil outside. How would they attack? Elaine and Rebecca were the targets. One of Satan's top assassins and her associates planned to have the two for their winter solstice sacrifices this night. Esther, not your real name, Elaine, Rebecca, and Betty, not your real name, gathered together in the family room for a short time of prayer. There wasn't much to say except to thank the Lord for his covenant and promise to keep them alive and ask him to work in this situation in whatever way he saw fit to bring the most honor and glory to himself. As darkness fell fully, Sheba increased her pacing and growling. The girls peeked out of the front windows and saw some shadowy figures around the edge of the property. There was a dark van out in the street in front and another on the side of their property. Several of the men were armed with what looked like shotguns, but it was difficult to tell clearly in the darkness. Esther began to cry. I'm so scared. Those people look dangerous. Is God really strong enough to stand against them? Her slender body was shaking with fear. Rebecca went over to her and took her hand. Listen, Esther, you know. Jesus is stronger. You have seen his power demonstrated over and over again. Now you must stand with us in faith and rebuke fear in the name of Jesus. Father promised us a haven here and he never goes back on his word. But are you sure you heard him right, was the tearful response. Yes, I am sure. He also confirmed the promise to Elaine and Betty. There is no doubt in our minds. Come, Esther, let us sing praises to our Lord and stand and watch to see how he will fight this battle for us. Betty put on some soft praise music and they all started to sing together. Time passed and the tension grew. Everything outside was deathly still, but the demonic pressure built steadily. 
They peeked out the windows again. There seemed to be even more shadowy figures out on the lawn. Some were coming towards the house. Betty spoke up. Listen, it is silly for us to stand here and be nervous and afraid. Let's do something constructive, like make chocolate chip cookies. The others laughed. Cookies, Elaine exclaimed. Well, why not? I just hope the Lord doesn't let those guys come in for some. So, they all gathered together in the kitchen. No sooner had they started the cookies than suddenly they heard a loud thump which shook the house. Then another and another and another and another. Five in all. Esther cowered against. The counter in the kitchen. I'll bet they plan to start a fire on our roof. That's typical for how these folks work, Elaine said thoughtfully. What do we do now? We stand. We just stand, was Rebecca's reply. If Father lets them come into the house then we will know that we must share the gospel with them, but I don't think he will let them come in, or start the fire. No sooner were the words out of her mouth than they heard the sounds of a tremendous scuffle taking place on the roof. Their house was typical of most desert homes, single story with a flat stone roof. The noise of the commotion and fight went back and forth from one end of the roof to the other. The cookie making was suspended as the girls stood praying and looking up at the ceiling as the noise increased. Suddenly, after about five minutes, there was a yell and loud cursing and a thud just in front of the house. There were more yells and thuds as the girls ran to peek out the front window. There, before their astonished eyes, they saw five men, cursing wildly, peeking themselves up off the ground. One had landed in the large cactus growing up against the front of the house. He cursed the loudest of all. The girls shouted with laughter and rejoiced and praised the Lord while the men went back to the Vendory group. Still laughing, they went back into the kitchen to continue with the cookies. Wow! Would I like to see what those men saw, exclaimed Betty. I wonder if the Lord let them see the angels that they were fighting with. Rebecca commented thoughtfully. I hope so, that will really shake them up. If they don't see the angels, I'm afraid they will just think they are fighting against more powerful demons. Oh, I have no doubt he did, said Elaine. I vividly remember the time I went against God's angels. It was a humbling experience, to say the least. We couldn't get through no matter what we did. It sure did start me thinking. Satan wouldn't tell me what they were, but inside I knew they were God's angels. It sure made me realize Satan wasn't as all-powerful as he said he was. About a half an hour later, they heard the men climbing back up on the roof. Sounds of an intense struggle again came from the roof. Shortly, the men were thrown off the roof again. But this time the men did not get to their feet. Instead, each one was grasped under his arms by an unseen force and dragged off the edge of the property. The girls did not see the angels, but there was no doubt in their minds that they were there. The men were unceremoniously dumped out into the street. The fight was over. The Satanists lingered around the property for another couple of hours, but they were unable to set foot back on the property. Finally they gave up and left. The girls ate cookies and praised the Lord for his wonderful deliverance from their enemies. As always, the Lord had kept his covenant. Once the victory had been won in this area, they were quickly faced with a new attack and a new battle with new lessons to be learned. Authors note, I am writing some of our adventures for a purpose. I want you, the reader to know that our God still lives and works today just as he did down through the pages of scripture. We still have a miracle working God. We are alive today only because of his direct protection and working in our lives. We also have a God who speaks to his people today just as he did in the days of the scriptures. We must rely on his guidance daily. Satan has a vast kingdom, but our God sits above the earth and heaven. Our God is the creator of all. He sees all and knows all. Satan makes endless schemes and plans, but our captain, Jesus Christ, reaches down his hand and plucks up a person here and a person there, frustrating Satan's best laid plans. Chapter 2. Pushpins. Rebecca, this call is for you, the receptionist said holding out the phone. Rebecca was at the veterinarian to get medicine for their cats. They had been under such a heavy attack by witchcraft that every animal in the house was sick. Rebecca's heart was heavy as she stepped up to the counter to answer the phone. Rebecca, a weak voice on the other end said, Come quickly, I think Elaine is dead and I don't think I can last much longer. They are here to get us. They are outside. I. Her voice faded out and the phone clattered as it fell to the floor. Annie, not your real name, Rebecca called. Annie, 
Answer me. What's going on? Silence. Except some strange background noise. Annie did not pick up the phone again. Rebecca handed the phone back to the receptionist. I'm sorry. I'll have to get the medicine later. I've got some sort of trouble at home. I have to run. So saying, she dashed out the door to her car. She was about a 10-minute drive away from home. The sun was rapidly setting and the shadows lengthening as Rebecca raced for home. Oh father, she prayed, I come before your throne and stand on your covenant with me. Satan cannot have the lives of anyone in my household. I counter-petition Satan, Father, in the name of Jesus. You promised me the lives of everyone coming under my care, now I am standing on that promise. Rebecca drove as quickly as she could. The short drive seemed endless. Her mind was whirling. What was happening? What could have happened in the short time she had been gone? She had only been away from the house about 30 minutes. The intensity of the spiritual warfare had been rapidly building in the past few weeks ever since Annie and her son Timmy, not his real name, had come to live with them. Annie had spent all of the almost 30 years of her life in Satanism. She was what is known as a breeder. She was given to the high priestess of the coven when she was an infant to be raised for this purpose. She had known nothing but the most terrible abuse from her earliest memories. She was used extensively in child pornography, then as a breeder. She had her first baby at the age of 11. She had 10 children, 9 of whom were sacrificed. The 10th child, Timmy, had not been sacrificed and was now 6 years old. Annie had gotten into contact with Rebecca, desperate to get out of the craft. She had then come to the Lord and eventually Rebecca had brought her into her home. The Satanists were not pleased. As Rebecca turned the last corner before her street the sun slipped below the mountains. Darkness would fall completely in just a few minutes. This hour of sunset seemed to be the time when the Satanists always launched their heaviest attack. As Rebecca reached her street, she saw a helicopter circling low over her home. So low, that the trees were whipping in the wind from its blades and many of the smaller branches were breaking off and blowing all over the lawn. As she approached her driveway, she noticed a dark van parked on the edge of the property and three men standing spaced across her driveway. The urgency within Rebecca was so great that she just acted without taking much time to think. She pulled up and jumped out of her car shouting to make herself heard above the deafening noise of the helicopter. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord. You have 20 seconds to get out of my way or I will run you down. In the name of Jesus Christ I command every one of you demons to be bound and break every incantation you have done. Now, get out of my way. So saying she jumped back into her car and backed down the street a short way. Then she stepped on the gas and headed for the driveway. The men were obviously surprised. They jumped to the side with only inches to spare as Rebecca rushed by. She hit the garage door opener and roared into the garage shutting the door as she entered. Screeching to a halt she jumped out of the car. Heart pounding, she ran to the door of the house and rushed in. Oof, Rebecca was knocked flat onto the floor as soon as she got through the door. She lay there gasping for breath for a few seconds. She had not been expecting such an attack. It was extremely rare that the demons could ever get her down physically. Shaking her head to try to clear her mind, she spoke aloud, You demons! I command you to get off of me in the name of Jesus. With that, she picked herself up off the floor and headed into the living room. The demonic oppression in the house was so heavy it was difficult to breathe. Evil was everywhere. The noise of the helicopter above made it difficult to hear. Anything. Fear was a palpable thing. As Rebecca entered the living room she quickly sized up the situation. Elaine was blue from lack of oxygen, lying on the floor having a grand mal seizure. Annie was lying unconscious in the kitchen. Her son was sitting next to her screaming and crying. Rebecca knew she could not resuscitate them all at the same time. Her heart cried out to the Lord for guidance. She quickly turned Elaine on her side, pulling her head back to open her airway so she could breathe. In the name of Jesus she commanded the demons causing Elaine to have a seizure to leave. Immediately the convulsive movements began to slow down. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to her, seal the house. Child, seal their house. Rebecca jumped to her feet. She grabbed a bottle of oil and set a new record for anointing their house. She ran as fast as she could from door to window to window to door, praying as she went, asking the Lord to cleanse and seal her home. As she reached the last door she shouted, 
In the name of Jesus I command every demon and human spirit in this house to leave at once. This house belongs to my God, you have no right to be in here, Father, she prayed. In the name of Jesus, I ask you to totally cleanse this home and make it holy for you. And, Father, would you please make us invisible or something to get rid of that helicopter? I can't hear myself think above the noise of that thing. Then Rebecca ran back to the girls lying on the floor. She rejoiced as she saw that Elaine was breathing freely again. Her color was starting to improve and Annie was moaning as she began to regain consciousness. Rebecca took Timmy into her lap, holding him in her arms, trying to comfort him. Suddenly the helicopter left, leaving them in a deathly silence. Rebecca quietly moved between the three, anointing and praying over each one. They were all in a lot of pain, but they were alive. The Lord had again kept his promise. They were safe and alive. The next couple of hours were busy ones as Rebecca helped each one into bed. She called Betty who came over in about half an hour to help. By then it was fully dark and the van had withdrawn a ways down the street, but still lurked menacingly outside. Finally, everyone was somewhat recovered and in bed. Betty and Rebecca sat up in the family room talking. Rebecca quickly filled Betty in on the event that had taken place. We seem to be entering into a different phase of warfare. Rebecca said thoughtfully. It's been a very long time since a demon was able to knock me down, and it was a really close call for the others, especially Elaine. I don't like it. I don't like it a bit. The thing that bothers me is how did they manage to get in? The house was sealed, wasn't it? Betty asked. Yes, it was. In fact, I just re-anointed it last evening because I felt so much oppression. Rebecca sat pondering the events of the evening. That helicopter bothers me too. Annie said the high priestess of her coven has used helicopters before. What is even more troublesome is the fact that this house was obviously an open thoroughfare for every demon they wanted to send in. Something had to break the seal but what? Betty chuckled. Yeah, what? That's the $10,000 question. Yes, I know, Rebecca replied. I don't want to go through another evening like this one. That was much too close for comfort. Little did Rebecca know just how many more times she would have to go through this type of attack. The next day, she went to the veterinarian's office again for medicine. This time going while it was still broad daylight. All the animals were sick, and Rebecca had no doubt that it was because of curses being sent towards them. Later that evening as she was fixing dinner, they all felt the oppression building again. Rebecca had called Betty to come over and stay the night to help. It sure feels like the witching hour again, Rebecca muttered to Betty as they worked in the kitchen. This is getting real old real fast. Yeah, I know, Betty said. I wonder what they'll try this evening. No sooner were the words out of her mouth than, crash. The sound came from the living room. Betty and Rebecca dropped what they were doing and rushed to see what was going on. Elaine was on the floor with the lamp on top of her. She had grabbed at it as she fell, trying to regain her balance. She was groaning and rolling on the floor. Elaine, what's happening? Rebecca asked as she knelt down beside her. They're ripping my guts out, Elaine moaned, doubling up. Betty ran for the oil. Evil was sweeping into the house. Again the air seemed to be thick with it so that it was difficult to move or breathe. Oh no, not again. Help, Lord. How can I stop this? Rebecca cried out desperately. The seal on your house is broken again was the immediate reply from the Holy Spirit. Rebecca, where are you? Betty called. Annie is down too. Rebecca headed for the kitchen. I've got to anoint the house. Hang on to them as best you can she called to Betty. Once again, Rebecca raced around the house, anointing and sealing and cleansing it. Once she had finished they were able to gain control of the situation and put a stop to the demonic attacks. The girls were becoming very weak and sick from the damage done to them by the demons. Rebecca and Betty worked steadily together until they got all three, Elaine, Annie, and Timmy settled in bed. There would be little sleep for any of them that night. Rebecca and Betty spent most of the night in prayer. Clearly, they were missing a key somewhere. What was breaking the seal on their home? Why could the Satanists send in demons to wreak havoc in the house? Earnestly they sought the Lord for answers. Early the next evening, as soon as the sun started to set, Rebecca went around and anointed and sealed the house again. No one is to go outside, she told the others. I want to see if we can prevent such an attack from happening. 
They prepared and ate their supper in an uneasy silence. Finally, Rebecca spoke up. We are certainly missing a key here somewhere. Those demons have legal ground to come in here, or the seal on our house couldn't be broken. Do any of you have any idea what it is? Legal ground is a doorway of sin that grants Satan legal access into your life. See Prepare for War, Chapters 9 and 10. For additional explanation. Both girls shook their heads. No, I don't know, said Elaine. Me either, added Annie. Well, we never had such an attack before you came here, Annie. There must be legal ground in your life somewhere. I want you to really get on your face before the Lord and seek him for the answer. Annie agreed that she would seek the Lord for an answer. No one slept much that night. About the middle of the night, Sheba started. Growling. Rebecca got up and peeked out the front windows. Men were again on the edge of the property, but seemed unable to actually walk onto the property. Rebecca sighed. How glad she was she had obeyed the Holy Spirit and had walked all around the edge of their property that evening, claiming it holy for the Lord's use and asking him to seal it with his angels. Suddenly, the Lord gave Rebecca a glimpse into the spirit world. All around the edge of their property stood a shining line of huge angels. They stood shoulder to shoulder facing outwards. They were dressed in pure white with gold belts, swords ready in their hands. They were silent as they stood motionless, waiting. Light radiated from them. All of the property seemed to be covered with a soft blue light. There were many more angels up by the house as well. Rebecca offered up a prayer of intense thanks to the Lord for his wonderful provision. And Father, please thank the angels for me as well, she prayed. They certainly have been busy around here recently. I do appreciate what they do. Thank you Father so much for your faithfulness and caring for all of us. I thank you in Jesus' name. Much comforted. She returned to bed. The battle raged for three more weeks. Over and over again the girls were hit with demons and knocked to the floor. Everyone was very ill the whole time. Night after night Rebecca fell onto her knees, crying out to her God for answers and grace to continue the fight. They were all becoming more and more weary. There seemed to be no end to the fight, and no answers either. Finally, the Lord spoke to Rebecca and told her that she must take Esther, Annie, Betty and Elaine and leave town for a week to rest. Rebecca discussed it with Elaine and Betty father says we are to get away for a brief rest. Goodness knows we all need it, but how are we going to get any kind of rest with the Satanists following us everywhere? Well, for one thing, we won't tell the others ahead of time where we are going, Elaine suggested. I don't think they would deliberately let the Satanists know, but they certainly seem to have some sort of pipeline to them. Where can we go? Betty asked. Oh. I believe Father is indicating to me that we should go to Hawaii. I have a special hideout there. So far Father has completely protected Elaine and I at this place. Fortunately it's not so expensive flying there from California. I'll make the arrangements and keep them as secret as possible. Let's also pray and ask Father to close all the ears of demons and Satanists so they won't know where we are going. We're all exhausted, that's for sure. I sure hope you're successful, Betty said. Carefully, their plans were made. At last the day came when all of them boarded a plane for Hawaii. They rejoiced as they did not see anyone who seemed to be following them. In fact, the first two days on the island were completely peaceful. But, their peace was to be short-lived. The third evening, at dinner, Rebecca and Elaine thought they saw two men whom they had seen following them back in California. When they asked Annie, she denied knowing the men, but refused to look Rebecca in the eye. Clearly, her behavior was different. That evening, they weren't back in their room very long before they were attacked by demons. Once the situation had been dealt with, Rebecca sat Annie down. Now listen here, she said, I've had all I can take. I have no doubt you do. Know those men. Anne, I am just as sure you know how those Satanists knew where we are. It only took them two days to find us. Now. You must have some kind of demonic transmitter or homing device on you. You'd better start talking and fast, or I'm going to put you out there and let them get you. We've played this game long enough. On the walk back to our room from dinner this evening father told me you know very well how they found you. Annie hung her head. I'm waiting, Annie Rebecca said in an exasperated tone. Finally, Annie spoke up. Well, yes, those two men are Satanists. I was afraid to tell you. So how did they know where to find us? 
Annie looked down and shuffled her feet uneasily. Finally she spoke again. Well, it might be my pushpins. What on earth are pushpins? Rebecca and Betty asked in unison. Elaine smacked her for it. Of course, why didn't I think of it? Rebecca turned to Elaine. Do you know what these pushpins are? Yes. Well why didn't you tell me before? Well, because you didn't ask me, and I didn't think about them. Rebecca fell back onto the couch. Well really. Here we are fighting tooth and nail for over a month and you guys just don't happen to remember a little detail like pushpin she was so exasperated she couldn't talk. Betty spoke up. What, exactly, are pushpins? They are tiny metal pins which are inserted under the skin in a special ritual. Demons are attached to the pins for various functions, Annie said. They enter the person when the pin is inserted. Let me guess, they function as a sort of radar homing device, I suppose. Betty asked dryly. Yes, and also for purposes of destruction. The demons associated with the pins are supposed to destroy the person if he or she ever leaves the craft. Annie was squirming and looked very uncomfortable. May I ask just why you never saw fit to tell us about these things? Rebecca asked. I didn't know what to do. They told me the demons with the pushpins would kill me before I could get them out. They're like time bombs, there's no way to escape them. Annie, Annie, Rebecca sighed. How can you believe such a lie when you have been privileged to see the Lord work in such power and in so many marvelous ways? Annie looked down at her hands. Well, I was afraid, she muttered. Once again Rebecca was faced with the stubbornness and fear that marks everyone coming out of Satanism. No wonder we couldn't keep the house sealed, she thought. Every time Annie went out and then back into the house she broke the seal by taking demons into the house with her. Everything was beginning to make sense. That was why the girls could be affected in such a devastating way by the demonic attacks. Another thought came to Rebecca. She turned to Elaine. Did you have one of these pushpins? Elaine nodded. Yes, I did, but I was afraid to tell you about it. So I asked the Lord to help me get it out. He did so. He literally pushed it out through the skin. It hurt a lot, but I did get rid of it. It's been so many years that I had forgotten all about it. They are sometimes also called inserts, or curse pins in some areas of the craft. See Chapter 6 for a more in-depth discussion of inserts. In other countries, they use different things instead of metal. Sometimes small flat pieces of rock, a small piece of wood, a tooth, or a piece of human bone. The purpose is the same, though, it is for control. A tooth or piece of human bone is also frequently used here in the U.S. Once a person has a push pin, the people in the craft always know where they are. And, when they leave, the demons attached to the pin rise up to try to kill the person physically. Well, now that we finally know what the problem is, what can we do about it? Betty asked. For two cents I'd like to take a knife and just carve them out, was Rebecca's exasperated response. No you don't. Not on me, Annie exclaimed. Betty laughed. You'd have to catch her first, Rebecca. Rebecca didn't answer because she was sitting praying, asking what to do in the situation. They all fell silent for a few minutes, listening to the steady pounding of the waves and the beach and the soft rustling of the palm branches. Finally Rebecca stirred. The Lord has been so faithful to us thus far and I believe he will be again. This problem must be dealt with and dealt with immediately. All of our lives are in danger until those push pins are gone. But how are you going to get rid of them? Annie asked. I'm not going to, the Lord is, was Rebecca's response. We can't very well go to a doctor and give a story such as this. No, I'm going to ask Father to burn them out, vaporize them, or whatever is necessary to get rid of them. I believe he will. Now where are they and how many do you have? Annie did not like pain, and she especially did not like the idea of anything being burned or vaporized out of her skin. Will it hurt? She asked. I don't know, that's up to father. You little wretch, after all the difficulties we have been through because you have refused to tell us about these things, I should just get a knife and cut them out. However, you are fortunate that we serve a very merciful God. Now where are those pins? Annie pointed, there is one in my leg and one in my hand. Rebecca got the oil and sat down next to Annie. Okay let's see what the Lord will do. She took the oil and covered the area over the pin in Annie's leg. Then she prayed, Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. You know our problem. 
I am asking you to flow your power into Annie's leg and vaporize or burn out this metal pin, or whatever is necessary. I also am asking you to completely remove any and all demons associated with the pin. Stop. Ouch. Annie interrupted. Rebecca, my leg feels like it is on fire. Ask the Lord to stop. It's hurting too much. I will do no such thing. If you had told me earlier, we could have gotten it removed by a doctor with a local anesthetic. Now, you'll just have to put up. With the pain. Annie continued to wiggle and squirm, but Rebecca held firm. She thanked the Lord for answering her prayer. The burning pain continued for about 10 minutes, then stopped. Prior to asking the Lord to remove it, Rebecca had been able to easily feel the push pin under Annie's skin. Now it was completely gone. Her skin was red, but no pin could be felt. They rejoiced and praised the Lord for his wonderful provision. One by one, all the other push pins were destroyed as well. Once again, the Lord had remained faithful. Everyone went to bed for the first peaceful night's sleep in a very long time. Chapter 3 Memories Rebecca put another log on the fire which was crackling merrily on the hearth. Flames of blue and green and orange licked over the fresh log as she carefully pulled the screen across the fireplace. There, that should do it for a while, she said as she settled down on the couch next to Joyce, not her real name. The house was quiet as everyone else had gone to bed. The cold winter wind whipped around the house outside, and the shadows from the flames danced warmly in the room. Everything was cozy and peaceful as Joyce and Rebecca settled down with mugs of coffee for a quiet talk. They had much to share. But, they had no idea just how soon their peace would be shattered by the rapidly approaching events of the night. Joyce is a young woman in her mid-thirties who had been involved in witchcraft for twelve years. She rose through the ranks of Wicca, becoming a high priestess, and, eventually, a courier between Wicca and a major network of covens. She had accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior about six months before meeting Rebecca, who helped her kick out all of her demons. Now, about a month after her deliverance, Joyce had come to visit Rebecca and Elaine. Joyce has, at the time of this writing, been out of the craft for a little more than two years. Rebecca, you will never know what an impact the cover of your first book had on me, Joyce commented. I received Christ, and was then nearly killed by the demons beating me up. I didn't think I would survive. A man at the church introduced me to Chick Publications, so I called them up and asked them if they had anything on Satanism. They said yes they did, and I thought, I bet, I figured it would be surface material. But, when I first saw the cover of that book I freaked out. I knew without a doubt that someone knew the truth about Satanism. Then when I started reading about Sister Courage I could hardly believe my eyes. I had been told that she was dead. I could hardly believe that she was still alive. You mean you knew Elaine while she was still in the craft, Rebecca asked in surprise. Oh yes. Anne, I knew Sedona, Elaine's associate. Sedona, her craft name, was totally hateful. She seemed to especially hate me. Boy was I glad when Sedona lost her position not too long before I came to Christ. Rebecca smiled. I've had a few encounters with Sedona myself. That was years ago when Elaine first came out of the craft. In fact, Elaine took me to her house once. Boy, talk about an evil place. I have heard recently, from someone coming out of the craft, that Sedona is still very angry with me. What do you mean? Joyce asked. Well, you see, one day Sedona Astral projected into my home to try to kill me. Instead, I ended up forcing her to bow down to Jesus with her nose right on the floor. I described the incident in my first book, He Came to Set the Captives Free, only I just gave her the name Sally in that book instead of using her craft name. Joyce laughed. I remember, you mean that was Sedona? No wonder she hates you so much. Bowing to Jesus would be an insult she would never forget. I was surprised when I read about that incident. Astral projecting into another person is very rare. Yes, I know that now, I didn't know that at the time. People who develop that degree of skill in astral projection pay a high price in their physical body. Sedona has aged very quickly as a result. Joyce nodded. Yes. I spent a lot of time learning to astral project. My hair started to turn gray while I was in my twenties because of it, Joyce chuckled again, so you made Sedona bow before Jesus. No wonder she hates you so much. Well, 
I figured she may as well start getting used to it. She is most certainly going to bow to him and confess that Jesus is Lord. In the end, Rebecca chuckled. Then she sobered. You know, I have no doubt at all that Sedona had a hand in the Satanist setup and frame job they did on me when they destroyed my medical practice and everything I had. I know that a rather prominent craft member has recently been trying to set up another frame by accusing me of selling drugs or some such. He has gained some prominence on the national scene in law enforcement by going around lecturing on occult-related crimes. He does what he does to protect his network of covens from exposure and to keep people thinking that Satanists don't really have any power. There is another one working on the same frame up who poses as a Christian pastor. He is also involved in the CIA. I also know that Sedona is out here in California currently. If she continues to come against us she is certainly going to further her education in experiencing the power of our God. Joyce nodded thoughtfully, unfortunately. What these Satanists don't understand is that they can't touch us unless the Lord allows it. Yes, and sometimes he does allow it. I am a good example. I am sure they thought they had a tremendous victory when I lost my medical practice and they got all those lies published about me. But what they don't understand is that my God was in control of it all. What Satan meant for evil, he has turned to good. I was in a very hidden and somewhat limited ministry then. And although I did reach many in Satanism while I was in practice, I am now in literally a worldwide ministry and reaching thousands more than I could ever have reached if I had stayed in a busy medical practice, she sighed. That was one of the toughest tests I've ever had to walk through, but it is wonderful to be able to rest in the fact that Father is all-powerful and all-wise. Everything that happens to us is for a purpose. The thing that irritates me is that the Christian community is so eager to pass around those false accusations against you without even wondering why none of the documents submitted in your defense are included with the package of accusations. People just don't stop to think, Joyce said. I know, but God is my defender. I am trying to reach those in Satanism to win them to Christ. Those involved in Satanism already know about that frame up and that the accusations against me were false. They know that I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am satisfied with that, because the Satanists are the people God has called me to minister to, Rebecca commented slowly. Both girls fell silent. After a thoughtful pause Rebecca spoke again. You know, Satan appeals to people with such glamorous promises of power and riches. So many people swallow the bait hook, lying, and sinker. Some do indeed gain incredible power and riches through their service to Satan. Rebecca said. But in reality, the price people have to pay to gain the cooperation of the demons is tremendous. The suffering, degradation, and corruption the demons bring into their lives is terrible. You are so right, Joyce commented with a shudder. Talk about bondage. Witchcraft is a terrible bondage. I was always having to worry about whether I performed each incantation exactly right. One tiny slip up and the demons would beat me horribly. I was in total bondage to all sorts of rituals, festivals, and high days. On top of all of that, I was always having to look over my shoulder. There was always someone else who wanted my position and was willing to kill me to get it. They also pulled me deeper and deeper into sin. Just before I came to Christ they forced me into blood sacrifices. I couldn't stand it, but there seemed to be no escape. Every day, there were rituals I had to do. How different it is now that I serve Jesus. Yes, you really can appreciate that scripture in Matthew 11, can't you? Rebecca commented. Quietly she quoted the beautiful passage. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is lie. Matthew 11:28:30. Joyce nodded in agreement. Anyone coming out of the occult has a real appreciation for that promise. I can't tell you what a release it was to realize that I didn't have to do any more rituals, keep track of any more special days, always be aware of whether it was the full moon or new moon or a thousand other things. That's the basic difference between white witches or pagans, and Satanists. The Satanists do blood sacrifices to appease the demons to get them to cooperate with them and give them power. The so-called white witches and pagans have to perform endless rituals to gain the same thing. And they dress the demons up with fancy names and call them spirit entities or gods or energies or vibrations instead of demons. 
Basically, Satanists don't have the patience and discipline to spend so much time and effort performing meticulous rituals. It is much quicker and easier for them to do sacrifices. They gain the cooperation of more powerful demons that way. The others deal with the less powerful demons, but they are demons just the same no matter what you choose to call them. You learn very quickly in witchcraft that there are no such things as impersonal energies. They are all very personal. You are either dealing with demons or the power of God, and humans cannot control the power of God. So anyone that is controlling an energy or power of any kind is dealing with demons. It is just that simple. It is so very different to serve a master who will forgive you instead of taking great delight in punishing you for any little thing. Jesus gives life. The demons always bring death. Rebecca stared thoughtfully into the gently flickering fire. What a difference there is between serving Jesus and serving Satan, she said. If ever there were any man on this earth who had the power to do everything Satan and his demons can and much more, it is Jesus. He created everything. But when he came to earth, he never showed off. When he did miracles they were frequently done in such an unobtrusive way that people sometimes questioned whether a miracle had even been performed or not. What an example Jesus set for us to follow. There was a pause, then Rebecca continued slowly. All Satanists like to show off and be in the limelight. But then, what human being doesn't? Naturally all of us would, and all of us would enjoy having power. Any one of us would use it to show off and make ourselves look big. I have no doubt of that. The desire to show off and look big is the very root of our sin nature. Satan had that problem too, and got himself kicked out of heaven for it. The demons cooperate with people to make them look powerful in front of others just to trap them into eternal destruction. But our God knows us through and through. That's why Jesus set such an example of humility for us. If we are going to serve him, we must follow it. What terrible sins we would fall into if we were given the kind of power demons give to their servants. When we become servants of Jesus, we quickly recognize the fact that we are nothing but sinners saved by grace. We have no power of our own, neither do we control the power of our master. Joyce spoke soberly, it is a very big change for someone coming out of the craft. I was used to having the power to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Now. I am utterly dependent upon the Lord without any power at all of my own. Oh, I realized the demons were just cooperating with me, but I considered their power to be under my control. As long as I obey them, that is. Now that Jesus is my master instead of Satan, I am finding out what it is like to wait on somebody else's will rather than doing what I want. Yes, Rebecca said, but unfortunately, sinful human nature being what it is, Far too many Christians try to develop ways to force God to perform when they want Him to. Just look at the number of so-called Christian leaders who gather together thousands of people to put on a show. If the Lord is really healing through them, why don't they quietly go from person to person instead of calling together so many people to watch the spectacle? I am very uncomfortable with these long, so-called prayer lines for healing and such. Going forward as individuals to kneel before the altar to do business with the Lord is one thing, but lining up a bunch of people before a crowd and then praying over them and having them fall over is something else. It seems like too much of a show to me. Pretty heady stuff for the person doing the praying and healing. Everyone looks up to them as being a powerful man of God, or woman of God. Jesus, on the other hand, went quietly through the crowd's healing. So many times. The person didn't even know just WHO had healed them. Over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus avoided the public eye, and he certainly never put on a show. Our God simply will not perform when we want him to. When people think they can control God's power, or at least use it when they want, they end up with demons performing the supposed miracles for them and pulling them deeper and deeper into deception. After a moment Rebecca spoke again, you know, in the ten years I've been in this terrible battle, not once have I ever been in control so to speak. I am only a servant, that's all. I have no power, and no control. I simply do what my master tells me to do. Sometimes I get impatient and wish I could have control of a particular situation, but in the long run I'm glad the Lord works as he does. The awesome power of God is so much greater than anything Satan or the demons or any of us human beings could ever think of having. You know Joyce, I'm proud of my master.
He is so utterly wonderful and wise and powerful and glorious I just don't have the words to describe him. My heart nearly bursts when I stop to think about him. He is so incredibly strong, yet he can be so very gentle and tender. What a combination. I'm just so proud of him. In Isaiah 42, 8, God says that he will not give his glory to anyone else, and I'm glad. I'm so glad. God is so utterly glorious, I'm thankful to the depths of my being that he will never change or give away his glory to someone else. Tears streamed down Rebecca's face. I can't begin to tell you how privileged I feel that this great God will actually allow me to be his servant. How thankful I am that he created me to give me the glorious privilege of experiencing him. It doesn't matter that I am nothing. It doesn't matter that I have no powers. My master has it all. I can completely rest in the total security of knowing that he is profoundly wise and always works in my life in the right way, the best way. He is in total control of every situation. You know. Satan has so many complex schemes and conspiracies. We can't begin to fathom them all. But to my master. They are all very simple. Oh, how I long for that day when I can finally go home and actually see him face to face. Amen to that, Joyce said with deep feeling. They were silent for a few minutes. Then Joyce spoke, saying, Unfortunately not only do too few Christians really appreciate the wonderful privilege God gives us to be in his service, they also refuse to acknowledge the reality of the spirit world. No matter what the Bible says. Yes, it really grieves my heart, the number of Christians who want to bury their heads in the sand and refuse to believe that any of this is real, Rebecca commented. The Bible has so much to say about the spirit world and Satan and his kingdom. It is amazing how many people choose to ignore it rather than learning how to defeat it through the power and authority of Jesus Christ. I know, Joyce said. Since I have come out of the craft I have been amazed at the resistance of so many Christians to simple things, like the truth about satanic infiltration of the churches. The Bible has a lot to say about it, but they don't want to hear it. Did you know that Wiccans are also trained to infiltrate and destroy Christian churches? Yes, I knew that. In fact, I know someone who has accessed one of Wicca's main computers. They found a rather complete hit list of Christians they want to discredit and destroy. Mary not your real name, was one of the people who trained me in how to infiltrate churches. That was her specialty. I also went to one of several special training camps for witches on how to destroy churches. It was taught by one of the well-known Christians on TV. Really? I'm not surprised, Rebecca said. Paul wrote that Satan's servants would reach positions of leadership within the churches. He told the Ephesian elders that from among them, the church leaders, would come ravening wolves to destroy the sheep, Acts 20:30. But tell me, what did Mary teach you? Joyce laughed. I'll never forget the first time Mary commanded me to come to a certain city in Kansas where a big evangelistic crusade was being held. It so happened that a crusade was being held by a particular denomination. Mary instructed me that I was to wear long sleeves, a long skirt and had to have long hair. I had to get a hair piece because my own hair was fairly short at the time. I had never worn such sedate clothes in my life. I thought I looked terrible. Of course, my ideas about clothing have changed a lot since I started to serve Jesus. Anyway, I was to meet Mary at her hotel room. She knew some of the top people involved in the crusade and was there to make sure they followed their orders. When I arrived at her room, I thought I had done very well with my clothing. I had never been in a church of their denomination before. When Mary opened her door, she took one look at me and grabbed my arm. You come in here girl, she snapped. You can't go looking like that. Remember, you must dress and act as they do or they won't accept you. She dragged me into her bathroom and took a washcloth and proceeded to wash every scrap of makeup off my face. I was horrified. But Mary, I protested, I look terrible without makeup. I never go anywhere without at least a little. Mary was very impatient. How many times do I have to tell you that you must dress and act according to their expectations? If you look like them and act like them no one will question you to see if you really are a Christian or not. And you know, she was right. We could move freely throughout the many people at the crusade and everyone accepted us as being Christians without questioning us at all. It was during that weekend that Mary taught me more about slaying in the spirit. Oh, I could already knock people unconscious just by touching them, but Mary told me that wasn't enough. 
She told me that because they were violating their own scriptures, James 5.14, by allowing anyone to lay hands on them and pray for them without even checking to see if they were a true servant of Jesus or not, that we were free to do whatever we wanted. Their God wouldn't protect them because they were in direct disobedience to his word. Mary understood that when people knelt before us, or even bowed their heads before us, that they were actively submitting themselves to us and accepting whatever we wanted to give to them. Of course they thought we were praying for them, but their submission to us gave us the legal right to put demons into them. They also directly opened the door for it by allowing their minds to go blank without testing the spirit knocking them out. Mary showed me the proper incantations to do and how to have people hold their hands up like this, figure 3-1. Then she would tap them first on one hand then on the other, then on their forehead, making the sign of an upside down cross, figure 3-1. Out they would go, every time. She then did it to me and I fell over unconscious. I guess I was out for five minutes or so. When I awoke, I found that I had acquired a new demon. Mary told me this special demon would put demons into the people I prayed for. And so he did. I'm sure that isn't the only way people put demons into people by having them hold their hands like that, but that is how we did it. Figure 3-1. You know, I have always wondered about the widespread acceptance of this. Slaying in the spirit by Christians. Have you ever stopped to think that they all fall backwards? In the Bible, in every instance, when God's people fell before his presence, they fell forwards, prostrate onto their faces in an attitude of worship. For example, John 18, 6 says, As soon and as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward, and fell to the ground. The Nib says, they drew back and fell to the ground. The Greek word for ground in that verse is chame, Strong's number 5476, meaning prostrate. One definition for prostrate in Webster's New World Dictionary is lying with the face downward in demonstration of great humility or abject submission. It seems like that verse may be saying that the men actually stepped backward, then, fell forward on their faces. I have never seen anyone slain in the spirit fall forwards, Rebecca commented thoughtfully. I don't have the answers to this question, but I can tell you I am really seeking and searching. I am very uneasy about the practice. I am not surprised that Satan's servants take advantage of the practice. Yes, you are right, Joyce said. I am horrified now as I look back at the number of Christians I put demons into through that practice. They were so eager and willing to go unconscious that they accepted anything I chose to put into them. I frequently put demons of false tongues into them. Then they would wake up speaking in tongues and think they had been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Rebecca nodded. Yes, it is sad. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit are real. And operative today. The gift of tongues is real. But, so very many Christians try to put God into a box and demand that he work when and how they think he should, that they accept all sorts of demonic deception as being the working of the Holy Spirit. Of course Satan is going to try to duplicate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Satan knows the power in them. What a victory he wins when he can get Christians to accept demonic counterfeits of the real gifts. How true that is, Joyce replied. Also, those to whom I gave demons of divination, would receive all sorts of what they considered to be words of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Those so-called words of knowledge were nothing more than information from a demon of divination. They were accurate, of course, but then the demons have so much information about everyone. Yes, I know, Rebecca said. I am sometimes amazed how many Christians accept false words of knowledge as being from God just because the information is accurate. They completely overlook that scripture in Deuteronomy. If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage 
to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Deuteronomy 13, 1-5 This scripture clearly shows that servants of Satan can do all sorts of signs and wonders and prophesy prophecies that come true. These do not validate them as being from God. How it must sadden God the Father's heart to see his children running after signs and miracles and accepting all sorts of demonic signs and miracles as being from him, Rebecca said. Yes, and that scripture shows that God allowed people such as myself and Mary to function within his church to test the people to see where their hearts were. They literally demanded signs and miracles from the Lord. We were only too happy to give them to them. They never tested any of us. If we could perform then they decided we must be from God. It just showed that they desired a miracle so much that they were willing to accept a demonic miracle rather than testing to find the true source. We do serve a God of miracles, but he never performs them when we demand them. That's the total difference between serving Satan and the one true God. Satan and the demons usually gave us the miracles we wanted when we wanted them, to encourage our selfishness and pride and self-centeredness. God always works to discipline our flesh sin nature, and helps us to conform to Jesus Christ. Rebecca nodded soberly, I know, and the tragedy is that most Christians are willing to serve Jesus only so long as it benefits them. They are completely unwilling to suffer in any way, especially not physically or financially. You know, Joyce said, that's where Mary was so very useful to Satan. She was willing to study the Bible to find out the places where Christians were going against God's word. She was smart enough to know that the instant Christians were disobedient to God we could very effectively come against them. Satan taught us that we had legal right or legal ground, as he called it, to put demons into them or afflict them with demons when they were walking in disobedience to their God. That's one time I know he was telling the truth. I saw it happen over and over again. It is a very sobering thing to think about now that I am a Christian myself. How I wish more people would listen to the testimonies of those of us coming out of Satan's service. Rebecca shook her head. Yes, I will never understand why so many Christians think they are automatically protected from Satan and his demons even if they actively sin against God. They completely overlook the scripture in Galatians 6, 7-8, which says we will reap what we sow. There is another practice in the churches that is so common yet is against scripture. I consider it to be very dangerous. It is the practice whereby anyone from the congregation can come up and lay hands on, and pray with, those at the altar. It doesn't matter if you are a first-time visitor in some churches, they will still let you do whatever you want. It provides a free-for-all for the infiltrating Satanists. Did you know that's how I got the very powerful demon of divination I had? Joyce asked. No, tell me about it. Well, I was in just such a church that allowed it practice. They completely overlooked the scripture in James 5 that says you should have the elders anoint and pray for you. There was a woman in that congregation who was a Christian. She had inherited a very powerful demon of divination. I recognized it immediately, of course. So, one day she went up to the altar for prayer. I went forward and told her and the pastor that God had told me to come pray for this lady, and that she was having a problem with a demon of divination. The lady knew she was having problems so they readily agreed with me. I laid hands on her and commanded the demon to leave her. What they did not know is that I had, with my spirit, called the demon to come into me because I wanted it. The demon promptly left her and came into me. They thought I was a really powerful Christian because the woman felt great relief as the demon left. They never knew that I was actually a witch who wanted her demon of divination. I'm sure we have no idea just how many times such things go on every day within the Christian churches. Both girls fell silent for a few minutes, each busy with her own thoughts. The fire was dying down, leaving only the light from a small lamp in the room. Suddenly the clock began to strike, bong, bong, bong. Oh, my goodness, it's midnight already and I forgot to call home to let my husband know I got here safely, Joyce exclaimed, jumping to her feet. I must at least leave a message on our answering machine. Can I use your phone? Of course, Rebecca replied, use the one in the bedroom. As Joyce left the room Sheba suddenly got up and began to growl a warning. Hmm, I wonder what's going on, Rebecca thought. Just then Joyce came out of the bedroom. Rebecca, doesn't your phone normally have a dial tone, she asked. Of course, 
Try the one in the kitchen. Sheba's hair stood up along her back. She began to pace from the door to window to window growling steadily. An evil presence began to sweep into the room. Rebecca jumped to her feet. This phone is dead, too, Joyce exclaimed. Then Rebecca reached for the lamp, clicking off the light, plunging the house into complete darkness. Now what? Rebecca muttered, heading for the windows on the front of the house. Rats, she exclaimed quietly as she looked outside. There on the front lawn were five dark figures. Two of them carried what looked like shotguns. A sixth figure came creeping around the end of the house. He must be the one who cut our phone line, Rebecca thought. That means they plan to come in for a visit and the purpose of their visit isn't very friendly, I bet. Elaine roused from her sleeping place on the couch in the living room. What's going on, she whispered. Don't turn on a light, Rebecca warned, they have guns. Elaine joined her at the window. What? Her question trailed off. They cut the phone line, Rebecca said quietly. Oh great. Now what? Rebecca was praying quickly and silently. Oh Lord, what is your will? Is it your will for us to lay down our lives at this time? No, came the immediate answer. Stand your ground, Rebecca heaved a big sigh of relief. Listen, Elaine, I know you're sick. You go back to bed and I'll keep watch. Father says he will protect us. Elaine nodded her assent and stumbled back to the couch. By that time, the figures outside had five black candles burning on the front lawn in the shape of a pentagram. As their soft incantations rolled, demons swept into the house. Rebecca felt their evil presence. Suddenly she thought about Joyce and the other two girls. I'd better check on them. She felt her way through the darkness into the kitchen. Joyce, she whispered, where are you? She heard a soft moan and stumbled over Joyce who was pinned down onto the kitchen floor by a demon. Rebecca knelt down beside her and put her hands on Joyce's shoulders. You demons, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord, she said firmly, you have no right to Joyce. Get off of her now, I command you in the name of Jesus. Joyce began to move and struggle to her feet. Those people are sending in some big guns, she whispered. I know, Rebecca replied. But father has promised to protect us. Come to the family room and wait there. I must find out what is happening to the other girls. Rebecca found Sue, not your real name, pinned to the floor in the hallway, and Rita, not your real name, pinned on the floor in the other bedroom. Both were extremely frightened. She helped them rebuke the demons pinning them down and brought them into the family room. They all joined together in prayer, asking father to protect them. Silence fell. The presence of evil continued to increase. Rita and Sue were shaking with fear. Listen. This is nonsense, Rebecca exclaimed. There's no reason for us to sit here in fear. Father has promised to protect us, therefore we have much more power available to us than they do. Let's use it. Sounds good, but how? Asked Sue. She and Rita had been living with Rebecca and Elaine for two months. God's word, that's our strength, Rebecca replied. Let's see how many scripture verses we can quote between us. We dare not turn on any lights to read, so we will have to do it from memory. Joyce was quick to catch on. Good idea, we have rebuked the demons and commanded them to leave, but they aren't budging. If they are going to hang around, then they'll have to listen to the word of God. Just one thing, Joyce, don't you dare quote any verses about going down into the pit, if you do I'll wring your neck, Rebecca said laughing. So they started out quoting scripture verse after scripture verse. Rita and Sue had not memorized any, but Joyce had been started on an intensive scripture memory program by Rebecca and had memorized a lot. As the two girls sat and quoted the beautiful words of scripture out loud, they all could feel the thick presence of evil begin to recede. Back, back it went towards the front windows, and finally, completely out of the house. Suddenly the Holy Spirit spoke to Rebecca, go to the windows now. I want you to see my power, she told the others and they all jumped up and went to peek out the front windows. The six figures were standing by their candles. Suddenly, all five candles went out all at once. The figures tried to relight them, but to no avail. Nothing worked. They could not relight the candles. They began to look around and suddenly all of them started to run off of the property. They ran down the street and disappeared around the corner. The girls shouted for joy praising and thanking the Lord for his wonderful work. Then they all went to bed and slept in peace the rest of the night.
Rita and Sue had learned a rather severe lesson. They had refused to memorize scripture. When they needed it the most, they did not have it available to them. They could not turn on lights to read a Bible. The Word of God is a sword. It is very powerful. The only way to have it constantly available to you is to memorize it. Would you the reader have had God's Word in your memory had you been there? Chapter 4. Cages and Curses. Riang. Ring. Ring. Rebecca fumbled in the dark motel room for the phone. Ring. I'm coming, I'm coming, she muttered. Finally she found the phone. Betty's voice was on the other end. I'm sorry to bother you, but I think you should know what's going on. What time is it? Rebecca asked, reaching for the light. Well, it's 10 o'clock here, was Betty's response. Rebecca clicked on the light and looked at her watch. Yeah, well it's 1 a.m. Here. What's going on? Rebecca and Elaine were in the eastern part of the U.S. on a speaking engagement. They had been asleep only one hour. Just long enough to make it very hard to wake up. They were both exhausted as they were nearing the end of a grueling week of seminars. Esther and I were over at your house this evening. I am very concerned about the couple Sarah, not your real name, has staying there. Rebecca was still a bit fuzzy with sleep. What do you mean? Sarah knows that when she is house-sitting for us she isn't supposed to let anyone into the house without our personal permission. I know, but I think she is very deceived and controlled. She thinks this couple are servants of Jesus Christ. The man calls himself a prophet of God but I really question just which God he is serving, Betty explained. Rebecca sat up alert. That got her full attention. Where did this guy come from and how long has he been there? Well, I don't know just where he came from, but he has been there a couple of days. He and his wife travel in an RV. Apparently Sarah met them two or three years ago. This prophet says he was sent to your place by God. So what has he done to make you think he isn't a true servant of Jesus Christ? Rebecca asked. Several things. First of all, his wife sits on the couch rolling her eyes up and back into her head humming what sounds like quiet chants, rocking herself back and forth while her husband is expounding on something. I tried to speak to her a couple of times, but she didn't respond. She seemed to be in a trance of some sort. The thing that really caught my attention was when he started telling us about how he had a dog which he loved very much. He told us that God told him that he loved the dog too much. So, he had to sacrifice it like Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac. He said he took the dog out and killed it and sacrificed it. Also, he told us that he sees into the spirit world all the time. He talked a lot about seeing werewolves. He says he sees demons continuously and that he sees the werewolves in the spirit realm. Christians don't see into the spirit realm all the time like that. I never could get any kind of statement out of him as to who he serves. He always sidestepped my questions and kept saying that he is a prophet of God. Oh no, Rebecca groaned. Didn't Sarah think that sounded a bit strange? Especially the part about sacrificing his dog. No, that's the problem, was Betty's sober reply. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't even hear it. She seems to be totally controlled by that guy. She thinks everything he says is wonderful. Every other sentence out of all of them is. Praise the Lord and hallelujah but I can tell you there is a terrible demonic oppression in your house. What's going on? Asked Elaine who was, by then, awake as well. Quickly Rebecca filled her in on what Betty had been telling her. Well, we know Sarah is a true servant of Jesus Christ, Elaine commented. This so-called prophet must have caged her. Ro, oh, wait a minute, what's this business about caging Rebecca asked. You never told me anything about that before. I know, I know, but I haven't had any reason to think about it before, Elaine said. Rebecca turned back to the phone as Betty was speaking again. Jack met him today down at work as well and had no peace with him at all. He couldn't get him to give any kind of testimony as to who he serves either. He told Jack also that he is a prophet of God. Jack thinks that he could be a servant of Satan. That brings confirmation. I'm glad Jack met this man, Rebecca said. Thoughtfully. He also kept saying that God told him not to work. That sure goes against 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Betty said. Do you have Esther with you? Rebecca asked. Oh yes, I couldn't leave her there as uneasy as I am about this guy. Good, Rebecca said in relief. Keep her with you at your place until we get home. I'll get hold of Sarah and tell her that couple must leave immediately. 
No telling what will be in our house by the time we get back. Rebecca had no idea just how much they would have to face when they got home. After Rebecca hung up she turned to Elaine. Now, tell me more about this. Caging incantation you mentioned. It's a very powerful incantation that is commonly used by servants of Satan. The person is literally put in a cage, spiritually, so that they cannot see the wrong actions of someone, or so that they will believe lies about someone. It's kind of like putting mental blinders on someone. You know, like the blinders they used to put on horses so they could see in only one direction. Satanists use it very commonly against Christians so that the Christians cannot discern that they are not true servants of Jesus. Once a person is caged, then it is easy for the Satanist to place all kinds of wrong thoughts into their minds and they will not realize that the thoughts are inconsistent with God's word. That's one way so much demonic doctrine gets accepted in the Christian churches. That sounds like a very dangerous incantation, for the Christian, that is. Rebecca said soberly. How can we protect ourselves from being caged? I'm not sure, Elaine said. I just learned how to use them, not how to prevent them. When I was in the craft, I was always alert to other people trying to influence me or control me. I would always send a caging incantation their way first to keep them from caging me. Wow, what a mess, Rebecca exclaimed. Indeed it was. My whole life was ruled by fear. I always had to be on the lookout because so many people wanted to knock me out of my position. There is no peace when you serve Satan. The two sat in silence for a few minutes thinking and praying. Finally Rebecca spoke, well, any incantation can be broken in the name of Jesus, but I'm afraid the person who is caged is going to have to be the one to break it. That's no small project to get someone already caged to recognize that they need to break such an incantation. They won't believe they are under any kind of demonic influence because they are caged. Exactly, Elaine said. But you know, when I was in the craft, I found that I couldn't cage Christians who refused to accept anything or anyone at face value but tested everything against God's word. They were the ones who didn't fall for someone just because of his or her charisma. I guess you could say they were like the Bereans, whom Paul commended so highly for searching out the scriptures to see if what Paul was preaching was true. I could easily cage those people who really didn't think for themselves and who were susceptible to following people with a lot of charisma. Rebecca nodded. Yes. That is precisely one of the greatest problems within the Christian church today. Too many people obtain positions of leadership simply because they have very charismatic personalities which naturally attract people. I have often wondered just how much so-called charisma was really demonic power. I'm sure some of it is natural, but I'll bet a lot of it may be demonic. I'm sure you are right. A Satanist who knows how to use his demons well will have people flocking to him thinking that he is the kindest most caring person they know. Kind of like bees to honey. Well, scripture is clear. Satan has always worked by deception and always will. So do his servants. I am very concerned, though. I am going to pray regularly against any caging incantations sent against me, Rebecca said as she lay down again. Two more days and they would be home. What would they have to face when they got there, she wondered. The prophet and his wife were gone by the time Elaine and Rebecca arrived home. Sarah left almost immediately as well. Betty and Esther came over for supper that night. The demonic oppression within the house was very intense. Rebecca and Elaine were exhausted. Wow, exclaimed Betty as she walked in the door. This house is loaded with demons. Yes, I know, Rebecca said wearily. The trouble is I'm so tired I just don't have the strength to go through the house thoroughly tonight. I plan to stay with you tonight, Betty said. I think you can use the reinforcements. I'll start going through and anointing the house while you finish dinner. She got a bottle of oil and started anointing the house. I doubt that just anointing will be enough, Esther said. While I was here, that prophet went around and anointed and blessed every room in the house. He also said he was going to walk the property and bless it as well. Oh no. That's all we need, Rebecca groaned. That means we'll have to wash down all the places he might have put oil to fully remove the curses. It was getting late in the evening by the time they finished supper. As the sun set, the demonic oppression began to build up within their house. Everyone felt weak and ill and exhausted. They decided to try to survive the night and start a major house cleaning on Saturday, which was the next day. 
Joyce was arriving the next morning to stay the weekend. She would help also. Everyone decided to sleep on the floor in the living room so they could all be in the same room for the night as they were expecting a fight. They had just started to doze off when Esther jerked upright. Look, she pointed. Rebecca sat up. A patch of blue light came floating through the patio door. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus I command you to flee. You must leave my house at once, the blue light extinguished. I can tell this is going to be a bad night, Rebecca muttered, lying down again. They managed to sleep a couple of hours. Then the blue light came into the room again waking first Rebecca, then the others. It extinguished as soon as Rebecca rebuked it. The rest of the night passed, but no one slept well. Joyce arrived the following morning. They all sat down to discuss what they should do. Betty started out. First of all, I want to know more about these caging incantations. Oh, they are very common within the craft, Joyce said. They are easy to do but hard to break. That is, it is hard to recognize when you are being afflicted by one. Elaine got a pad of paper. Here, she said, let me show you some of the symbols you can be on the lookout for. You may find a piece of paper with symbols on it like this, figure 4-1. Figure 4-1, common caging incantation symbols. That's right, Joyce agreed. Many times, though, the incantation will be placed on the person's property. I'll bet we could find some on yours if we looked carefully enough. It can simply be done with four sticks or branches or reeds. They are placed on the ground like this. They look like sticks that have just fallen naturally onto the ground. Figure 4-2. That's right, Elaine spoke up. In the center of the square or rectangle is placed some object such as a hair, a button, or it could even be something as small as a piece of lint off your clothing. They can also write your name or initials on the ground rather than placing an object there. Joyce agreed. Figure 4-2, sticks used in a caging incantation. Figure 4-23, ley lines. Does the piece of paper have to be placed in the person's home or on their person in order for the incantation to work? Rebecca asked. No, Elaine and Joyce said together. Those are just things you can be on the lookout for. If you see them around then you know for sure such an incantation has been done. We should also look for ley lines, Joyce said. What's that? Rebecca asked. To do ley lines you do an incantation over a stick which is then used like a wand. They can drag it along the ground beside them. It looks like they are just playing idly with the stick. But everywhere the stick touches the ground the ley line is placed. If you look very carefully you can sometimes see a very thin line in the dirt where the stick was dragged along. Figure 4-3, Joyce continued. When you walk around a property and put ley lines all around it, it is like a giant cage around the whole property. It is used for the following reasons. To claim the property for themselves and Satan. To place demons all around the edge of the property to guard it. To place special doorway demons or openers, as they are sometimes called, so that the Satanist can easily astral project onto the property. You see, it isn't so easy to find your way around when you are astral projecting. So if you leave specific demons in the places where you will want to go, you can just astral project to them. Place specific sentinels. These are demons who are watchers. They communicate to the Satanist about anyone that comes onto the property or anything that happens on it. And lastly, the demons place there are to bind and bind everybody coming onto the property. To cage them, in other words. I see, Rebecca commented. We walk the ground to declare it holy for the Lord asking him to place his angels around it. The Satanists do essentially the same thing, only they place demons and claim it for themselves and Satan. Yes, that's it exactly. Joyce said. Okay Rebecca said. The first thing we will do is carefully search the whole property outside to remove any and all curses. I want to be sure to command off any of those opener demons so those folks can't astral. Project onto our property so easily. I'll bet that's why we have had so much trouble with astral projecting human spirits these past several months. I didn't know to get rid of those opener demons. After we cleanse the property we'll start on the house. They all agreed and went outside. It took about an hour to carefully walk over all of the property. They found several places where there was melted black candle wax, and sure enough, there were slender branches arranged as illustrated above in each of the four corners of the property. 
The sticks were removed and the incantations broken and the demons commanded to leave. Next, the girls turned their attention to the inside of the house. This was not an easy project as there were a multitude of places cultic objects could be hidden. As the day progressed, the demonic oppression became more and more severe in the house. A terrible rotten sulfurous odor began to permeate every room. Demons stink. That is why you will always smell incense being burned in occult bookstores. It is burned to hide the stench of the demons. As the girls searched, they found a crystal doorknob in Elaine's bedroom. I haven't seen one of those since I was a little girl, Rebecca commented. I know for sure that we have never had anything like that in our possession. What a strange thing to leave. Not really, Joyce said. Anything crystal can be used for communicating with demons. Who would suspect that a doorknob could be used for that? That's why crystals are so popular with the New Age movement. We used to just call them hagstones before the New Age movement popularized them. This type of doorknob is frequently placed in the homes of higher level Satanists. It's sort of a status symbol. The doorknob was destroyed. By the evening, everyone was feeling sick, Esther most of all. They gathered together in the family room for prayer. Elaine got up to get the oil to anoint her. Betty, Joyce, and Rebecca stood up to gather around Esther. As Elaine walked back from the kitchen, she was suddenly struck from behind by an unseen force and pitched headlong over the back of the couch, yelling all the way. There she stuck, head down in the pillows, feet kicking wildly in the air. Everyone burst out laughing. Elaine is so short. She fit perfectly in the corner of the couch. Hey, quit laughing and help me up, she shouted. Joyce and Betty helped her back onto her feet. Well, these demons certainly are unhappy about our little prayer meeting, Rebecca said, still laughing. The laughter helped lighten their mood and they began to feel a bit encouraged. After they had prayed, the girls had supper and went to bed. They were all exhausted. Again, the blue light kept floating throughout the house waking them up. Sometimes it started flashing like a strobe light. It extinguished when rebuked, but quickly came back again. About the middle of the night, Esther got up to go into the bathroom. Crash. Hey, stop that, she yelled. Crash. I command you to stop in the name of Jesus. Betty and Rebecca dashed for the door, only to find that they couldn't open it. Esther, open this door, Betty called. The doorknob rattled. I can't, Esther said. It's not locked, but I can't open it. Those wretched demons knocked me into the bathtub. Rebecca got the oil. Only after they had anointed the doorknob and commanded the demons off of it could they open the door. Esther was bruised, but otherwise unhurt. In the very early morning, Joyce got up to go to the bathroom and stumbled on something soft in the living room on the way. Yuck, she exclaimed when she turned on the light. The house had been completely closed and locked up all night, but there. In the middle of the living room floor was a dead bird. Its wings were spread out, and feathers carefully placed below it in a pentagram. That was the end of their sleep for that night. The stench in the house grew worse. The girls washed down walls, scrubbed carpets, looked under furniture, tore apart beds, but still could not find the final door which the demons were using to have such free access to the house. Taking showers became a real challenge as the demons would turn the shower head around and around spraying the water on the walls and ceiling. The water would run hot and cold, hot and cold. They learned to shower with one hand on the shower head. Several days later, they were almost in despair. They had prayed intensely, asking the Holy Spirit to show them the thing they were missing. Finally, Betty found the last problem. Hey, look what I found, she called from Esther's bedroom. They all went in to see. The ceiling of all the rooms in the house were of textured white plaster. There in the plaster were tiny nails, driven into the ceiling in the shape of a pentagram. They looked in the other bedrooms, and sure enough, there was a pentagram made in nails in the ceiling of each room. That was the final key. Once the nails were pulled out and disposed of and the curses associated with them broken, the house was clean at last. In all, it took almost two weeks of hunting before Rebecca's home was finally cleansed. They found symbols in oil on the pictures that were framed with glass over them. These were very hard to see unless you looked at an angle so that the light would catch the clear oil. Curses had been placed on the mirrors so that these could be used as doorways for demons to enter the house. That seemed to be the main doorway for the demon that manifested as a blue light to come and go. 
Once they cleansed all the mirrors the blue light no longer appeared. Mirrors are a rather common doorway as beginning witches frequently use mirrors to establish communication with the spirit world. Rebecca's house was cleansed and peace again restored. But the damage done by the caging incantations of this couple to their relationships with several other people will probably never be repaired this side of eternity. All Christians must be alert to this source of trouble, especially pastors and Christian leaders. Never overlook the possibility of being afflicted by a caging incantation. These incantations can either blind you to the wrong actions of someone, or turn you against someone who has done nothing wrong at all, leading you to believe as truth all sorts of lies about them. If you think someone may be sending such an incantation your direction, simply command any and all caging incantations to be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Command all the demons associated with such incantations to leave you at once in the name of Jesus. Terrible damage is being done within Christian churches and in relationships between people because of these incantations. We must always be alert and sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. No one is immune to this type of attack. Chapter 5. The Armor of God. As the last dryer clicked off, silence dropped like a blanket over the laundromat. Joyce jerked out of her thoughts, startled by the silence. She was folding her last load of laundry. She looked up and glanced around, to find that she was the only person left in the building. She was growing uneasy. Quickly she grabbed up the last of her clothes and plopped them into the basket without folding them. As she did so she heard the back door open. She glanced up and froze. There, just inside the door stood two very large young men. They stood side by side looking at her in silence. They radiated evil. Oh Lord, help, Joyce prayed. She grabbed up her basket of clothes and her car keys and headed for the front door. The two men by the back door did not move. As she hurried towards the front door, a white limousine pulled up in front of the laundromat. Two more large men walked up to the front door and took up positions one on each side of the door outside. Lord help me get through, Joyce cried out in her mind. Fear rolled over her in waves. As she reached the front door and stepped outside onto the sidewalk, the back door of the limousine opened and a woman stepped out. At first glance there was nothing remarkable about her. She was rather sloppily dressed in tight black pants that revealed she was somewhat pudgy. Her shoulder-length hair was mostly gray. but. She radiated powerful and evil demons. Joy stopped in her tracks, swaying as the demonic force of the demon Lord Dantalion hit her. The woman was Sedona, Joyce's mortal enemy when she was still in the craft. Waves of fear rushed into Joyce. Flashbacks poured through her mind in rapid succession. Horrifying scenes of torture and torment. She struggled to think, struggled to breathe. It was as if she was sinking into a sea of mental torment. Summoning all of her strength and will against the onslaught she forced her feet a couple of steps forward, hanging on to the laundry basket and her keys for dear life. Sedona stepped forward, blocking her path. Just where do you think you are going, she snapped. Joyce shook her head, trying to clear it. I'm going home, she stammered. Oh no you're not. You're mine. With the last bit of strength she had left, Joyce spoke as firmly as she could. Oh no I'm not. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I belong to Jesus. Sedona hesitated a moment, but only for a moment. She reached out and grabbed Joyce's arm at the elbow in a cruel grasp. Joyce jerked back and tried to pull away, but was unable to break free. Pain shot up her arm and enveloped her in waves. Burning pain. Instantly, the mental torment increased a hundredfold. Pictures were whirling through her mind. Terrible pictures of demons and torture of other human beings. She jerked back again, but was unable to utter a word. Sedona dropped her arm. I've got you now. The full moon is in four days. You are now my prize, my sacrifice to Lord Satan. Again, Joyce shook her head, but did not have the strength to speak. Sedona continued, her words coming like rapid fire shots. I know your every move. Then she proceeded to list with 100% accuracy everything Joyce had done the preceding week. I can get you any time I want, she boasted. Something moved Joyce's feet. She started to walk, she didn't know how. She was detached, unable to control herself. Inside, she cried out to the Lord for help. She just couldn't think. Those horrible scenes continued to fill her mind. Sedona was furious, but seemed strangely unable to do anything further. You're mine, she hissed. 
I'll get you anytime I want to. I'll make you pay for humiliating me. I'll get you, soon. As she spat out those last words, she climbed back into the limo. Suddenly, Joyce was running. Across the parking lot she ran. Her car was parked on the far side of the lot. It seemed like miles, but at last she reached her car. As she opened the door with trembling hands, the limo roared out of the parking lot. Joyce climbed into the car and pushed the key into the ignition. Then, she passed out and remembered no more. How much time passed? Joyce didn't know. Suddenly, she opened her eyes. She blinked in surprise as she realized she was driving into her driveway. She had no memory of the drive home at all. She pulled the car into the garage and somehow got out of the car and into her apartment. There she collapsed in tears onto the floor. Thank you, Lord Jesus, she wept. Thank you for getting me home, that was as far as she got. Then Talion attacked with redoubled fury. Pain exploded in her head and down into her arm and stomach. She doubled up in pain. The horrible horrifying pictures rolled in her mind, seems too terrible to describe. I rebuke you and bind you demons in the name of Jesus, Joyce muttered weakly. The attack lessened a tiny bit. She crawled toward the phone. The demons attacked again. She started beating her head on the floor. No. In the name of Jesus no, she cried. She grasped her head in both of her hands and forced it to stop. I command you to stop in the name of Jesus, she said again, this time with a little more strength. Once again she crawled for the phone. I must call Rebecca and Elaine for help, she thought. At last, she reached the phone, but she was too weak to stand. She fumbled, trying to reach the phone on the kitchen counter. Ah, at last, her hand found it. She knocked the phone down on top of her on the floor. A bottle of oil that was sitting on the counter next to the phone fell with it. Thank you Jesus, she breathed as her hand closed around the bottle of oil, only to have it fall from her hand as the demon struck again, knocking the breath out of her. She felt as if a huge hand with claws was ripping her guts apart. The oil, get the oil. Bind the demons put in your arm by Sedona, the thought from the Holy Spirit cut through the chaos of tortuous scenes exploding in Joyce's brain. Yes Lord, she sobbed. Please help me Jesus. She scrambled forward and grasped the oil bottle again. Stop in the name of Jesus, she commanded again. This time she got the top off the oil bottle and poured it over her arm where Sedona had grasped it. Now, she cried out. Burning pain shot up her arm. In the name of Jesus I command every demon put into me by Sedona to be bound. Leave in the name of Jesus. The pain eased up in her mind began to clear a little. She picked up the telephone and dialed. Elaine answered. Rebecca wasn't at home, but Elaine joined with Joyce in prayer. The demons were forced to back off some, but they didn't leave. I'll call Rebecca, Elaine said. She's down at work but I'll get her to call you. Joyce hung up and waited, praying for strength. Praying with Elaine had helped. She was at least able to think now. She was gaining strength. She got up off the floor and sat on the couch. Well at least I'm making progress, she thought with a wry smile. Ring, it was Rebecca. Briefly, Joyce described what had happened. Tell me Joyce, did Sedona put an insert, or curse pin in your arm, Rebecca asked. Joyce hadn't thought of that. Carefully she felt her arm. There it was. Yes. She said slowly. I can feel it, now I see where it went in. It feels like it is working its way in deeper. Yes, I expect it is. The demons like to do that. It has to come out of there and fast. Do you have any oil there? Rebecca said. Yes, I've already anointed it, Joyce responded. Good, but you must do so again. We must ask the Lord to stop that thing from going into you any deeper. I'm also going to ask him to push it back to the surface. You anoint your arm and I'll stand with you in prayer. Okay, Joyce smeared the oil on her arm again over the area where the curse pin was. Rebecca started to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus we come before your throne. I counter-petition Satan for my sister Joyce. She belongs to you, Lord. Satan has no right to her. In the name of Jesus I ask you to stop this curse pin and bring it out to the surface. In the name of Jesus I command every demon associated with this pin to be bound. Joyce moaned. Her arm was starting to burn again, and the demons were ripping at her stomach. Then the pain began to ease. I feel better now, she told Rebecca. 
I can see a dark spot. I think it's the end of the pin. Good. You hang in there. I'll be home as quick as I can. It will be about an hour. That's okay, Joyce said. I'm really feeling better now. By the time Rebecca arrived home, Joyce had improved enough to drive over to her house. She was there waiting for her. She was still being tormented with flashbacks, but not as severely. The curse pin was easily visible just under the surface of her skin and easily removed. It was a tiny metal pin, about one half inch long, the size of a largish splinter, but very deadly. As soon as the pin was removed, Joyce commanded Antalion and all the demons associated with the curse pin to leave at once in the name of Jesus. They did so and she was clear at last. Figure 5-1 Figure 5-1 Photos of curse pins I'm not sure that's the end of all this, Rebecca spoke thoughtfully. Well, if this is the kind of incantation I think it is, it probably isn't, Joyce agreed. Sedona knew to use Dantalion because he is a particular demon lord. Who really hated me? I recognized him immediately. He has a peculiar ability to afflict the mind. This pin looks like an effigy pin used in voodoo. I think I know the incantation Sedona has done. I am afraid because I have been through several previous rituals which set me up for this incantation. I had wires placed in that arm that could be used. I never expected that anyone would use them, but Sedona knew about them. Why would you do such a thing knowing the possible consequences? For power. Rebecca sighed. Of course. Satan's servants will do anything to gain more power. Well, I have no doubt Sedona could have done this death incantation. Rebecca commented. Let's see, after tonight there are three more days until the first night of the full moon. This incantation was to be completed then, I suppose. That would go along with her threat to have you as a sacrifice this full moon. Yes, that's right. This type of incantation takes place over three or four days. You obtain a large black candle in the shape of a male or female. Then the incantation is done which includes a blood sacrifice of some sort. Part of the incantation involves lighting the candle and sticking six to nine effigy pins into the candle at specific positions depending upon what you want done. All but one pin is inserted into the candle. The last pin must be inserted into the person you are placing the incantation against. Then, in this particular death incantation, as the candle burns continuously over the three or four days, the pin in the person is manipulated by the demons. It literally seeds other pieces of metal which correspond to the total number of pins. The pieces of wire previously placed in my arm are demonically controlled after the insertion of the curse pin. As the candle melts down, the pieces of metal grow together in the person in the shape of an upside down cross. On the first night of the full moon, the incantation is completed and the upside down cross in the person is completed. As the candle burns out, the person dies. It is a very old and powerful voodoo curse. Well, we have the main pin out of you, but I am still concerned about those other wires and the seeds, Rebecca said. Do you suppose the demons had time to place them in you? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised, Joyce said slowly. What can we do about it? What we always do, Rebecca said. We ask Father to take care of it, we'll anoint your whole arm and ask him to bring to the surface any other pins or metal before the final night, so, they anointed Joyce's whole arm and prayed accordingly. In fact, three days later, on the first night of the full moon, a red, raised, blistered upside down cross began to form on Joyce's arm. Three more pieces of wire were removed from her arm along the lines of the upside down cross. As the wires were removed and Rebecca again anointed her arm, the red lines disappeared and the curse was completely broken. Joyce is alive and well. Only the power of Jesus Christ can break such a powerful curse. After praying and anointing Joyce's arm, they sat quietly for a few minutes. Then Rebecca spoke again. Listen Joyce, she said soberly, there is a lesson to be learned here. That was too close for comfort. Yes I know Joyce said with feeling. It was only the hand of the Lord that saved me. Father has honored his covenant with you again. He saved my life. Only God kept Sedona from abducting me right there. She seemed strangely unable to do anything but make threats. Yes I know, Rebecca nodded. But Joyce, she should never have been able to touch you. How could I have prevented it, Joyce asked. I was hemmed in on every side by those men. You should have started fighting immediately. 
Remember how I have been telling you the armor of God is real? It is real in the spirit world but it affects the physical realm also. Yes, but I just don't understand how I could have used it. I did rebuke her in the name of Jesus. That wasn't enough. You took a purely defensive posture. You just stood there. Because you didn't fight, you submitted to Sedona. That's why she could do what she did. You allowed fear to take over. You should have taken aggressive offensive action from the beginning. If you had, she could never have gotten her hand on you at all. She should never have been able to put that curse pin into your arm. Joyce rubbed her forehead tiredly. I'm sorry, but I just don't understand. Rebecca stood up and put her arm around her, giving her a hug. That's okay. You are too tired to go into it tonight. It is late and you have to go to work in the morning. Go to bed and we will talk about it tomorrow when you have had some rest. In the meantime let's pray and ask Father to help you understand. Stay here tonight where you are safe. Exhausted, Joyce agreed and stumbled off to bed. The next day, Joyce returned to Rebecca's house from work about mid-morning. She was excited. Rebecca. Listen to this. Last night the Lord. Gave me a dream showing me the armor and how to use it. I understood, finally. Then today he gave me a chance to try it. Great. Tell me about it. I got to work this morning to find that they were overstaffed. So, I volunteered to take the day off. As I went down the hall towards the nurses. Locker room to change. I saw a man dressed in the uniform of the maintenance people coming towards me. No one else was in the hallway. When he saw me he quickened his pace. I immediately recognized him as being one of the men that had been with Sedona yesterday. He had something in his hand that looked like a knife. I wasn't about to go through what I did yesterday. So what did you do? Rebecca asked. As he came close to me I said no, stop in the name of Jesus. You are not going to touch me father had showed me how the shield goes on my arm. Figure 5-2. I held up my forearm in front of me and stepped directly toward him. He looked so shocked. I didn't see the shield, but I have no doubt that he did. I literally pushed him right up against the wall without ever touching him physically. He stood flattened against the wall with his mouth hanging open. I commanded all of his demons to be bound in the name of Jesus and told him again that he could not touch me. He just stayed there, up against the wall. Then I turned and darted into the locker room. When I came out he was gone. I did not see him again. Figure 5-2, Shield of Faith. Wonderful, Rebecca exclaimed. That's exactly what I was trying to talk to you about last night. Even though we do not see the armor of God, it is real armor in the spirit world. We can use it in the physical world if the Holy Spirit so directs. Yes, that is exactly what Father showed me in that dream. He showed me how the helmet of salvation comes down over our head to protect it. He told me that when those demons of fear first hit me I should have instantly rebuked them in the name of Jesus commanding them to flee, refusing to accept them because I was protected by the helmet. They got to me because I accepted the attack instead of repulsing it. Then he showed me the breastplate of righteousness and how it protects our chest. The belt of truth is like a girdle and is the only piece of armor that goes around our back. You know, like the armor the Roman soldiers wore. The shield is big, almost as tall as we are. And, the sword is exactly as you had it drawn on the front of your two books. It is pure white light with a golden handle. Rebecca nodded. Yes, how do you think I knew how to have the artist draw the sword? You never told me you had seen it, Joyce said. But, come to think of it, I suspect there is quite a lot you haven't told me. Rebecca laughed. Yes, I suppose there is. I remember very well a few occasions when I had to use the armor of God in the physical world. I first. Learned about its reality when the Lord allowed some demons to physically manifest and try to kill me. Then, the Holy Spirit showed me that we have that armor by faith and can use it when He directs us to do so. So when did you use it? Joyce asked. Well, one time was several years ago when I was still in medical practice. I had gone back into the hospital to see a patient in the middle of the night. The parking lot for the doctors was a short walk from the hospital and the hospital wasn't in a very good section of town. I had to walk alone to my car that night. It was about 3 a.m. I was uneasy. Everything was too quiet, and it was just a couple of nights before the full moon. The Satanists were really getting angry with me because I was bringing so many to Christ. This particular night, 
I reached my car and stopped to look around because I sensed that someone was in the parking lot, but I couldn't see anybody. I tried to put my key in the lock, but it wouldn't go in. Something was blocking it. I commanded any demons to leave at once who were interfering with my lock, but nothing worked. I heard a sound and whirled around to see four big tough looking guys coming my direction. Their demons radiated. I had no doubt at all that they planned to serve me up as the main dish for their sacrifice to Satan that full moon. It's a wonder that I didn't have a heart attack on the spot I was so frightened. I am sure they were throwing every demon of fear at me they could. What did you do? Joyce asked impatiently. I commanded them to stop and commanded their demons to be bound in the name of Jesus, but that didn't seem to faze them. They just kept right on coming. I continued rebuking them, and they started to laugh at me. You are sadly mistaken if you think your Jesus can protect you from us, the leader said jeeringly. They were about ten feet away from me by then. Suddenly the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Don't forget the armor, he said. So, in faith, I just asked the Lord to put his sword in my hand and make those guys see it. Then I held my hand across the front of me as if there was a sword in it. Immediately the men stopped in their tracks in surprise. They shielded their eyes as if against a bright light. I was delighted. Okay boys, I said. If you want to fight, come on. I'll fight you with this. They stood still for a minute and then the leader spoke up and said, Yeah? I'll bet you don't know how to use that thing. What to bet, I said. Then come on and I'll show you. I do not fight with my own power, but with the power of my master Jesus Christ. You and your demons are no match for him. They looked uncertain at that point. I pressed my advantage and took a few steps toward them, rebuking them again in the name of Jesus. They stepped back a step, so I continued walking toward them, still holding my hand in front of me. It's a good thing they didn't know how my knees were trembling. I learned early on that I could never show fear or pain. They shuffled their feet uneasily. Then, suddenly, they broke and ran. I hurried back to the car and this time the key worked in the lock just fine. Boy did I get out of there as quick as I could. Did you see the sword? Joyce asked. No, I didn't. I had to stand in faith that it was there because the Holy Spirit had told me to use the armor. But they obviously saw it. Satanists can see in the spirit world most of the time anyway, but the demons screen what they see. That is why I asked Father to make them see the sword. Otherwise, I was afraid the demons might have kept them from seeing it. I wish I could have seen it but I didn't. I suppose if I had seen it then faith wouldn't have been necessary. We always have to walk this walk in faith. Yes, and sometimes that's very difficult, Joyce commented. Tell me about some of the other times. Well. Rather than talking about myself, let me tell you about an experience someone else had recently who also came out of the craft. Do you remember any, not her real name? I think you met her once while she was here didn't you? Yes, I remember her. She stayed with us about five months. She was horribly abused in the craft. Her mother tried to take her and run when she was about seven years old. They were caught and taken back. Annie was then forced to watch her mother be sacrificed as punishment. She was used as a breeder and in all sorts of pornography, both as a child and as an adult. She tried to get out once, about three years before I met her. Two big thugs from the craft caught her and took her back and horribly abused her sexually as punishment. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior this time though. That makes all the difference in the world. You're telling me, Joyce said with feeling. It is impossible to get out of the craft and live, any other way. Only the power of Jesus can keep you free. About a month after Annie was fully delivered, a day came when she needed to go out to the shopping mall and I couldn't go with her. I can't protect everyone all the time. It's times like those that really test my faith. But I know these folks have to learn to stand on their own feet with the Lord. I let Annie go, but I was very concerned. Esther went with her. Later that evening, the Holy Spirit spoke to me telling me to pray that Annie was in trouble. I had company here at the house, so I asked them to join with me and we all stopped to pray for Annie's safety. About an hour later, Annie and Esther came home. Annie could hardly walk in from the car. Here is what happened as she and Esther told it to me. Just that morning on the day Annie went out for the first time on her own, I had been talking to her about the armor of God as given to us in Ephesians 6. I told her about the reality of it. 
I remember telling her that sometimes if you get in a tight spot it is helpful to pass your hand up and down in front of you and say something like I know I have a shield right here in front of me, a shield of my faith in Jesus Christ. It is not necessary to do this, of course, but it helps you stand in faith in a difficult situation. Little did I know that Annie would have to use that shield later that same day. As Annie and Esther were walking along in the mall, suddenly Annie stopped short as she was confronted with three huge men. Annie is a tiny thing, she is short and only weighs about 90 pounds. All three men were well over six feet tall. Two of them were the same two Satanists who had caught her three years previously when she had tried to run. They were the same ones who had abused her in such a cruel way sexually as punishment for trying to run from the coven. The mall was busy, as usual, and hundreds of people streamed past without ever taking notice of the incredible scene unfolding there. Esther took a couple of steps back in fear, not knowing exactly what to do. Annie just stood there in silence looking up at those three men. The leader spoke menacingly, you are coming with us. Annie was trembling with fear, but she managed to speak. No I am not. Things are different this time. I now serve Jesus. I no longer serve Satan. So what the man jeered. You are coming with us. You won't get off so easy this time. Annie was so afraid she didn't know what to do. Suddenly the Holy Spirit flashed into her mind what I had said about the shield of faith earlier that day. She took a deep breath and passed her hand up and down in front of her saying. No. You cannot take me. You see, I have a shield in front of me. The shield of the power of Jesus Christ my Lord. The three men laughed. What shield? I don't see any shield, the leader said. But I'll tell you what, if you want to fight I'll take you on. My power against your power. Even when Annie was in the craft she was no match for this man. She had never had demons as powerful as his. She was shaking so hard that she could hardly speak, but she said, Okay, but I don't have any powers anymore, so it will have to be my God against your God. The men laughed and jeered again. Annie just stood there. As the men started sending demons against her she was overwhelmed with terrible flashbacks. She said the only scripture she could remember was Luke 10 19 which she kept repeating quietly over and over again. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, Luke 10 19. The battle raged in the spirit world as Annie just kept standing. The demons afflicted her horribly. They tormented her in her mind and body. She swayed under the onslaught, but continued to stand. The men began to look puzzled, then they began to look uncertain. After a couple of minutes they took a step backwards, then another. Annie continued to stand. Suddenly, all three of them turned and literally ran out of the shopping mall. Praise the Lord, Joyce exclaimed. Amen. What a victory that was, Rebecca agreed. Annie was battered, but she stood. The shield of her faith in Jesus Christ protected her. Our Lord was faithful as always. She had demon bite marks on her neck and was very weak and sore, but she was alive, and they did not get her. We anointed her wounds with oil and commanded all the demons afflicting her to leave in the name of Jesus. The marks all disappeared over the next hour and she recovered. I know of another incident that happened just recently with D.G., Rebecca said. T.G. is a young man that recently came out of a high position within the craft. After his deliverance I was talking with him about the reality of God's armor. I told him that I wouldn't be surprised if the demons attacked him in physical manifestations as well as from the spiritual realm. A few days later he shared this incident with me. T.G. was sleeping in the back of a van. In the middle of the night he was awakened with a jerk when the back doors of the van blew open with tremendous force and he was sucked out of the van and landed on the ground about 15 feet away. As he struggled to his feet. He was confronted with one of the demons who had been one of his spirit guides. The demon was in a physical manifestation and told T.G. that he was going to kill him. T.G. said that somehow he had hung on to his pillow when he was blown out of the van. He was so frightened that he could hardly think what to say. He rebuked the demon in the name of Jesus, but it just kept on coming at him. He said that then he remembered about the armor of God. T.G. told me that he didn't have the faith to just stand there without anything in front of him. So he held up the pillow saying, See this, this is the shield of the Lord. You cannot touch me because I am protected by Jesus. The demon just laughed and said, You think that little pillow is going to protect you from me? 
I'll show you. Then the demon proceeded to reach out and claw at the pillow viciously. The pillow was torn to shreds, but the demon could not reach beyond it. Although TG could not see it, clearly there was a shield in front of him. Try as the demon might, he could not get through that invisible shield. After a few moments, he gave up and disappeared. TG came over and showed me the shredded pillow the next morning. He told me that in all his years in the craft he would never have attempted to ward off a demon with just a pillow. But praise the Lord, behind that pillow was a very real shield. The precious shield of his faith and his new master, Jesus Christ. If only Christians would realize the reality of the spirit world and of God's armor, there would be many more victories against Satan's kingdom. Joyce nodded soberly. Yes, and we are fast entering a time when we will be seeing more and more direct confrontations between Satanists and God's people. Authors note, it is my prayer that Christians everywhere will begin to wake up and realize what wonderful provisions have been made for us by our Lord. We do not need to fear Satan and his servants. However, we must never underestimate them because they are powerful and their power is real. But, praise God. They don't have any power at all compared to the awesome power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 6 Demonic Wounds The more I work in this ministry of helping people out of Satanism, the more I learn about demonic wounds. By this, I mean injuries directly caused by demons. The Lord has graciously made provision for the healing of these wounds, but we must be able to recognize them and know how to treat them. Those of us who have never been involved in Satanism must understand that those brothers and sisters in Christ who were once in Satan's service are peculiarly vulnerable to demonic wounds. I don't know why, unless it is a part of the reaping process they must go through. The first characteristic of any demonic wound is the inability of the wounded person to recognize the demonic cause of the wound. The first thing the demons do is try to blind the person to the fact that they are dealing with demons. As long as the wounded person doesn't recognize that demons are the primary cause of the wound, they will not rebuke the demons or drive them away. This leaves the demons free to continue doing damage. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Luke 10 30, 33-34. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. James 5 14-15. The keys to dealing with demonically created wounds are found in these two scriptures. The Lord has clearly indicated in these scriptures that the pouring in of the oil and prayer of faith in the name of Jesus is necessary. However, what too many people overlook is this, if the person, who has been wounded or is ill, has unconfessed or active sin in his her life the sin must be taken care of at the same time or they won't be healed. It has been my experience many. Many times that if someone who has come out of the craft is getting wounded frequently, there is legal ground in their life for the demons to afflict them. They may not always know what it is, but if they will ask the Lord to reveal it to them, He is always faithful to do so. Sometimes people are wounded simply because they forget to ask the Lord to place His full armor on them each day. I cannot emphasize strongly enough the importance of the armor of God. There are four basic types of demonic wounds. Direct physical damage. Poisoning. Inserts. Illness. Direct physical damage. The most common wound in this category occurs in what seems to be an accident, but is actually caused by a demon. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago I was rushing to get ready to go to a wedding. I finished ironing my dress and leaned over to pull the plug of the iron out of the wall. Suddenly my arm was caught and held against the iron. My natural reflex was not enough to pull my arm away from the hot iron. I had to use my other hand to do so. Naturally, I received a deep burn on the side of my left arm as a result. Because my natural reflex was not sufficient to pull my arm away from the hot iron, I should have immediately realized that the wound was demonic in addition to the physical burn. It was more than just an accident. However, I was in a terrible hurry, 
and the demons did their best to block my mind from recognizing that they were involved in the wound. I hastily placed a dressing over the burn and rushed off to the wedding. I had a speaking engagement that evening and again the next day. My arm was extremely painful, but I did not stop to think about it long enough to recognize the demonic component of the injury. Finally, two days later when I had a chance to slow down, I started thinking about the burn. I had applied aloe vera, which normally always relieves the pain of a burn. In my case, it increased the pain. So did every other ointment I tried. Also, I noticed that the area of the burn was getting bigger and was, by then, so painful I could hardly stand it. This is not normal for a second degree burn. The pain should have started to lessen by the third day in the case of normal healing. But, this wasn't a normal burn. As I looked at the burn and began to pray about it, the Holy Spirit brought back to my mind the circumstances of the accident. Especially the fact that my natural reflex had not been enough to pull my arm away from the iron. Immediately I realized that this was a demonic injury. I got out my bottle of oil and literally poured it over the entire burn saying, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command every demon associated with this burn to leave me immediately. I command you to stop afflicting and extending this burn, and in the name of Jesus I command pain to leave now. Father, in the name of Jesus I ask you to bring healing and pain relief to this burn. I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Immediately the pain lessened, and the burn then started a normal healing process. However, because I had let it go so long, it had extended to twice the area of the original burn and took almost three weeks to heal, leaving a scar. I have no doubt at all that if I had stopped and anointed the burn immediately, I would not have had such a severe wound. I have found that pure olive oil is not harmful in open cuts or burns. I have used it repeatedly in such cases. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the alcohol in the wine was used to cleanse the wound and the oil was used for healing. I will always anoint with oil first, then cleanse the wound with some sort of antiseptic, add whatever healing ointment I have available and bandage the wound. Here is another example. Sam, not his real name, was a martial arts expert before accepting Christ. After he came to Christ, he was working on the lawn of his pastor's home one afternoon. The demon that used to be his spirit guide appeared to him and threatened to kill him if he did not renounce Christ and go back to serving Satan. Sam, being a very young Christian, instead of simply rebuking the demon and commanding him to leave in the name of Jesus, said something like, No way, bug off. The demon lashed out and clawed Sam on the head leaving three gashes to the bone extending the full length of his scalp. Sam was knocked unconscious on the ground. The Holy Spirit alerted the pastor that Sam was in trouble. He went out and found him unconscious in a pool of blood on the ground. The pastor picked Sam up and took him to a nearby hospital where the three lacerations in his scalp were stitched closed. However, the pain did not lessen. Instead, it continued to increase over the next two days. That's when Sam came to see me. The pastor had anointed Sam with oil, but both he and the pastor had been afraid to put oil on the lacerations because of the stitches. Sam's pain was extremely severe by the time I saw him. There was no evidence of inflammation around the stitches, although the wound did not show the normal healing it should have for three days. I took olive oil and poured it over the three lacerations covering them completely. At the same time I rebuked the demons and prayed as I did in the above example with my burn. Within a few seconds the pain was gone out of Sam's head. We simply used clean gauze to daub the oil off the stitches and left the lacerations open to the air as they had done at the hospital. The wounds proceeded to heal normally. There is another common type of direct physical injury caused by what the craft calls brush acid. Those skilled in astral projection use this preparation extensively. It is simply a mixture of hydrochloric acid, occasionally some other kind of acid is used, mixed with agar. Hydrochloric acid burns the skin just the same as a flame. It is easily obtainable from any laboratory supply house. Agar is a thickening agent, which is used as a basic ingredient for mediums used to grow bacteria in any laboratory. It is cheap and easily available. Agar thickens any solution similar to gelatin. The agar acid mixture is about the consistency of runny jello. It is clear and easy to apply to any surface. Anyone brushing against the acid, or getting their hands into it can receive a severe acid burn. Satanists astral project and put this brush acid on such things as car door handles, door knobs of homes, 
countertops, etc. Those extremely skilled in astral projection can carry the brush acid and directly place it, or brush it, onto a person in the physical realm. The physical person cannot see the spirit carrying the acid, and the acid cannot burn a spirit. I know this sounds really far-fetched to those who have never been in the craft, but those who have served Satan know that what I am writing is true. People use it in the physical realm also, of course. We have most frequently found it on the handles of our car doors. It is simple to remove by flushing with water, but you cannot touch it with your bare skin. We usually flush the area with plenty of water and then wash it with soap and water and then anoint it with oil. If you receive a burn from such a source, you should immediately flush the affected part with copious amounts of water and then anoint it with oil as I have described. Then treat the resulting burn the same as you would any other burn. Once I received a terrible burn in my mouth from toothpaste. We were traveling on a speaking engagement. Apparently somebody got into our motel room and injected acid into my tube of toothpaste. Since that time I have never left medicines or toothpaste in a hotel room in my absence. Also be careful of any unusual insect bites. Demons can use spiders and such, but do not do so commonly. If you suspect demonic involvement in an insect bite, simply cover the bite with oil and command the demons to leave. Demonic insect bites will always produce a much more severe reaction and inflammation than a normal insect bite. Demon bites are also a reality. They show up on the skin as a physical bite mark, or sometimes a pattern of tiny spots of red, called petechiae, in a circular pattern. These, too, are simply treated by anointing with oil. Another type of demonic wound that is very common is a physical injury for which you have no memory of its origin. It is not uncommon for one of us to become very weak or ill. When this occurs, usually we start looking for some sort of injury. Frequently, it is a significant cut somewhere and we will have no memory of when the cut occurred. Normally, an injury of this type would cause enough pain that we would clearly remember when we got it. These, too, must be anointed with oil. Poisoning. Almost from the beginning of time, poisoning has been a very popular method of doing harm to an enemy. This is certainly true of those in the craft as well. However, their poisons are all mixed with demons and demonic powers. Therefore, there are two things to be dealt with, the physical poison and the demons. Some common substances which are available in most any occultic bookstore are not, in themselves, very toxic. But, when combined with special incantations, they can be deadly. Others are very deadly and must be ordered. Under the counter in occult bookstores are through occultic supply houses. Some of the common substances used in poison potions are Ova Ursi oil, Valerane root, Vervain oil, Muckroot, Mandrake, Bloodroot, Quicksilver, Mercury, Tannis root, Worm root, Cyanide, Hemlock, Karari, Ginseng root, Double Cross powder, Cyanide. Unfortunately, as modern scientific technology progresses, witchcraft takes advantage of all the advances. One of the most significant is the use of DMSO. DMSO stands for dimethyl sulfoxide. This is a chemical that was developed originally for use in horses. It is an excellent anti-inflammatory agent. It is rubbed on strained ligaments, inflamed joints, etc. In 1988 it was finally approved by the FDA for use in humans. DMSO has one property that makes it particularly valuable to the occultist and to drug users. It is absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream within 20 seconds. Thus, most anything mixed with DMSO is also absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream in 20 seconds. The occultists love to mix their various poisons with DMSO. The unfortunate person who then gets the solution on his her skin gets into trouble very quickly. DMSO is readily available at most any veterinary supply store. Frequently the poisons and DMSO are mixed with gum arabic to make it stickier and harder to get off the skin. Be careful. If you suspect a poison has been placed anywhere within your reach, use rubber gloves to handle the article and to wash off the substance. If you have put your hands into something that contains DMSO, wash the area. Gently with copious amounts of water and then with soap and water. If you rub your skin hard with DMSO, blisters will be raised on your skin and the rate of adsorption will be increased. You can be alerted to the fact that you have gotten into DMSO by the fact that, as it is absorbed through your skin into your bloodstream, 
You'll experience a peculiar smell similar to that of oysters or fish as the DMSO travels in your blood through your nose. Many times you will also experience a taste of fish as well. Some poisons also come in powdered form and can be placed on paper or on gummed stickers or labels. The poisons can be absorbed through your skin from the paper, or taken into your body by licking the stickers, etc. There have been cases of children poisoned with LSD through gummed stickers or stars which they lick to stick on their papers, or through stamps. Those of us in such a ministry as this must always be alert to guidance by the Holy Spirit. Only He can alert us to these dangers. One characteristic common to most all occult poisonings is that the symptoms of the illness frequently come on every day at the same time as the poisoning occurred. Such things as intense headaches, muscle aches, fever, weakness, etc. Also, it will frequently get worse at sunset as the demons become much more active at dusk and throughout the night. Some of the most powerful poisoning incantations come out of writings called the Grimmeries. These are very old books that were written by the alchemists of the Middle Ages in Europe. They were the scientists who tried to turn common substances into gold, and bring life out of inanimate substances. They were, in reality, very powerful sorcerers. These volumes are still available today, for a price, but are strictly under the counter type materials. I have been told that three of the common demons used in the various poisoning incantations from the Grimmeries are Valifer, king of all occult medicine and death. Valifer cannot be called up without a human sacrifice. Alasas, king of torment. Andras, lord of swift destruction, especially mentally. Occultic poisonings that are mostly all demonic have limited time intervals in which they can work. These are governed by the astrological signs and astronomy. Most poison incantations are done at the rise of a particular planet, such as Saturn, and run out when the planet sets. This is usually a period of one to three months. If it is a bad time of the year for the stars, they will use a more deadly physical poison. The demonic portion of a poisoning can be rebuked and driven away by prayer and a simple anointing with oil. But the effects of the physical poisons can be lasting. I know. I have personally been very close to death four times in the last year because of physical poisons. However, I believe that I am alive today because I never put so much as a sip of water into my mouth without first praying and asking the Lord to purify and sanctify it according to 1 Timothy 4, 5. Mark 16 17 18 has been fulfilled in my own life a number of times. In purely demonic poisonings. Many times the person can actually feel a burning or tingling sensation traveling up his or her arm immediately after getting their fingers in a poison, or getting something such as a splinter in their hand. You must anoint immediately with oil to stop the spread of demonic power into the rest of their body. I learned this lesson the hard way. You must apply the oil like a tourniquet above the level of the spread of demonic power, and then drive the demons down and out of the extremity. Figure 6-1 if the person is alone and does not have someone to help them, they should apply the oil tourniquet first, then wash the area thoroughly to remove any physical poison, or remove the splinter or insert, and then drive the demons down and out of the extremity by using the oil as in the illustration. Also, be careful. If you are involved in a ministry similar to our own, the craft will place their people as employees in all the restaurants in your area. We have been severely poisoned more than once through fast foods restaurants. Never. Develop a routine. The safest restaurants to eat in are smorgasbords or buffets. It is impossible for craft employees to poison all the food on a buffet or salad bar. We rarely eat out except when we travel. I tend to cook everything at home. It's much safer that way. Figure 6-1. Inserts. Inserts are just about anything that gets inserted under the skin or into the body that has a demon, and sometimes physical poisons, the most common is cyanide or mercury, attached to it. Not only is it impossible to completely clear a person of demons while these inserts are still in place, but the demons associated with the inserts frequently cause amnesia. The person will sometimes be unable to remember all of the inserts they have, and are important rituals in which they have participated. As you look at other cultures around the world, you will find the use of inserts everywhere. For example, Hindu women in India frequently wear a particular gem or stone embedded in the skin in the center of their forehead. This is the position of the third eye, see chapter 10. This links them with their God and supposedly gives them special vision into the spirit world. 
Various African tribes are well known for pieces of bone inserted into their noses, ears, or lips. I think it is no accident the gay movement has popularized earrings for men. What effect does the placement of such earrings have in a non-homosexual young man? I would be very concerned about this if I were a young man. I am not saying that all jewelry is demonic. However, some of it is. We as Christians need to be much in prayer about everything we do. There are at least seven categories of inserts. Push pins, see chapter 2. Curse pins, see chapter 5. Nail pins. Satan's web. Crystals. Demonic IUDs. Dental inserts. Splinters. Nail pins are basically the same as push pins. They are inserted into the bed of the fingernails or toenails. Most commonly, the fingernails. They have the same functions as the push pins. Satan's web is a piece of fine silky material about 2 by 3 inches in size. It is swallowed in a ritual. The web is placed as sort of a time bomb which goes off if the person ever turns against Satan. It produces an intense acid in the stomach and will eventually destroy the stomach completely. It produces all sorts of severe stomach pain and even bleeding, but little is found on physical examination because the process is purely demonic. The Satan's web must be specifically renounced and the person must ask the Lord to completely remove it. Once this is done, the symptoms quickly disappear. Crystals are extremely small and are actually demonic parasites. Although they are crystalline in nature, they are a living parasite. I have seen these under a microscope. They are usually inserted behind the eardrum, into the bloodstream, or simply under the skin. They are about the size of 1 to 3 grains of salt. Some are red, some are white. In the craft, the red crystals are frequently called the red devil's crystals. If a woman has a baby that is delivered on a satanic altar, or in the presence of other satanists, these crystals are often inserted into the artery and veins of the umbilical cord of the baby as the cord is cut. Both the baby and the mother are affected demonically by the crystals. It is not possible to completely clear someone of demons until these crystals are specifically renounced and the Lord is asked to remove them. If possible, they should be physically removed. They are capable of creating devastating illness, even death within four to six months of placement. Demonic IUDs are often placed through various procedures. These may be made of metal, but they always have a demonic component. Both the metal and the demons must be removed. In fact, I have been told by more than one high-ranking Satanist who has turned to Jesus, that the whole concept of the intrauterine devices were devised by craft doctors in the first place. One of these was a man who was a physician who participated in extensive research in the various satanic medical procedures. He also told me that much research is currently going on that makes what was done in Hitler's concentration camps look like nothing, an IUD does not prevent conception. It prevents implantation of the early fetus in the uterus. In essence, it causes an abortion. The craft doctors consider these IUD caused abortions to be sacrifices to Satan. The IUD went over big at first, but quickly many women started having major problems with them. Heavy bleeding, cancer, etc. Finally, the government withdrew approval for them because of these problems. Why so many problems? Was it only because of the physical presence of the IUD? I doubt it. I think it may well have been because of the demonic component as well. How many innocent women had an IUD placed simply for birth control, never realizing the original purpose for which it was developed? Please note, I am not saying that the companies that manufactured the IUDs were working for Satan. They very well may have had no idea at all of the original purpose for their design. Remember. Satan always works through deception. Any Christian woman who has an IUD should have it physically removed and then close the doorway. Remember, all abortions are human sacrifices to Satan. If you have had an IUD, you should ask the Lord for forgiveness and cleansing and then command all demons that came into you through the IUD. And IUD caused abortions to leave you at once in the name of Jesus. Dental inserts are common amongst the higher Satanists. These are usually computer chips that can literally be traced by satellite. Thus, until these are removed, the person can be traced anywhere in the world. Their location is known at all times. A variation of these computer chips are currently being introduced into the general population of the U.S. and other countries. They have been used in animals for several years. In the winter of 1989 and 1990, 
the Kraft began pushing the implantation of computer microchips into children, either under the skin of their right hand or in their forehead. The stated purpose is to prevent the many kidnappings here in the U.S. The microchip contains information as to the child's identity and medical history. The child's location can then be traced by satellite quickly in the event they are abducted. The various child-finding organizations are beginning to push this in some states already. Also, I have heard from some higher craft members who have just recently come to Jesus, that these computer chips will be placed in driver's licenses and credit cards in the near future. Thus, the person carrying the license or credit card can be located at all times. I have been told that the only thing that can shield these chips from detection by the various scanners is lead. Lead is also effective in shielding from the infrared scanners which can locate any living creature by the heat emitted from its body. Is that why there is such a move recently to recall all lead and to outlaw the use of lead in our country? Are these computer microchips the mark of the beast? I think they very well could be. A person with such a computer chip in place cannot hide anywhere in the world because of the satellite access. Scientific technology is so advanced that the world can be photographed and mapped by satellite with a resolution of inches or less. With the rapid shift towards a totally cashless society, what would seem more logical than the implantation of such a record-keeping and identity mark? After all, credit cards can easily be lost or stolen. New Zealand, as of 1990, is very rapidly moving to a cashless society. Everyone will use a bank card or credit card. No one will use cash anymore. Secular newspapers in both Australia and New Zealand are currently running articles and cartoons showing the switch from the credit card to a mark of some sort on the person's hand or forehead. Scripture is being fulfilled in our day, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, and there was given unto him, the beast, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given him while kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 1. 5, 7-8, 16-17. Please note, scripture says the mark shall be received in the hand or forehead, not on. Could this be because the Lord knew an insert would be used rather than a simple surface mark? I suppose you could say that the mark of the beast is the ultimate satanic insert. Many different demonic things are implanted in people through ritual sex. During ritual sex, usually a female is placed on an altar and or is used as the altar. This person is then sexually used by humans, demons, or animals. I have found that complete deliverance is not possible until episodes of ritual sex are renounced and every demon kicked out that was placed into the person during the rituals. Many times push pins are placed in various areas of the reproductive tract during these rituals. Commonly, children abused in satanic rituals describe hot needles being placed in various areas of their genital and reproductive tracts. They are describing inserts. The simplest way to deal with these is by asking the Lord to burn out or remove these pins or implants, and by commanding every demon associated with the implants to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. I know that the memories of such rituals are extremely painful to the person who participated in them. I usually explain to the person that they must bear the pain of remembering long enough for us to deal with the problem. Then, as each episode of ritual sex is confessed and the demons are kicked out, I always pray and simply ask the Lord to completely wipe out the memory of the ritual from the person's mind forever. Our Lord is so very gracious. He has been faithful in answering my prayers in this area. Children who are ritualistically abused are always put through some form of ritual sex. Inserts are commonly placed in these children. Push pins are frequently placed in the reproductive and urinary tracts. These are hard to x-ray because of the demonic component. Demons can and do hide things on x-rays. This is a very commonly missed source of trouble in children who have been abused. Once again, I have found that the Lord is very gracious and will remove the pins directly. Our Lord has such a special love for children. He deals with these little ones very gently and tenderly. Splinters of wood or metal are most commonly used. 
Demons are experts at handling these. Again, most often the wound seems to be just an accident. However, the consequences can be very grave. In the case of inserts, the demons cannot be removed from the person until the physical substance placed under the skin is removed. Demonic Illnesses These are physical illnesses caused by demons. Sometimes the demons simply set a physical problem in motion which then continues on its own. Sometimes, they remain and continue the problem themselves. In the first case, rebuking and driving away the demon will not stop the physical illness. A very common method of demonic discipline within the craft is by kidney stones. Demons can very easily create kidney stones. These are extremely painful to pass. However, once the physical kidney stone has been created, removing the demon will not have any effect on the course of the problem. The stone will still pass unless the Lord chooses to directly intervene and supernaturally dissolve the stone. I have often seen upside down crosses blistered into the skin of someone who has come out of the craft as a result of an incantation. The result of such a wound is usually some problem with the organ located underneath the cross, such as the kidney or stomach. Such things must always be completely covered with oil and the demons commanded away in the name of Jesus. I also always command all incantations to be broken in the name of Jesus. Remember, demons can, and do, cause illness. But not all illness is demonic. We must remember that physical as well as spiritual death was the result of Adam's fall. The alteration in our physical bodies caused by sin makes us vulnerable to an array of physical illnesses. We must always look for a purely physical cause of any illness, and seek the discernment of the Holy Spirit to alert us when there is a demonic component also. Through the years I have found that one of the first things demons affect is the rapidly reproducing cells. These are found in such places as the bone marrow and the lining of the intestinal tract. Very commonly, people who are severely afflicted with demonic illness are completely unable to break down or adsorb complex proteins or fats. This is because demons can so readily affect and damage the cells lining the stomach and intestinal tract. It is rather a joke amongst my friends, some of them physicians also, that anyone involved in spiritual warfare is usually on Tagamet or Zantac, medicines that help reduce the hyperacidity and ulcers which are common because of the demon's peculiar ability to hit in this area. All demonic illnesses create a tremendous protein drain. The body's natural defenses are quickly affected by protein deficiencies. The white blood cells, which fight infection, quickly become unable to function as they normally would when a protein deficiency is present. I have found two items that are very effective in handling this type of problem. They require a prescription from a physician, but I hope some Christian physicians will take heed to my experience. There are two products called Vivanex HN and MCT oil. Vivanex is a preparation of pure amino acids, the building blocks of protein. It is directly absorbed through the gastric and duodenal mucosa without requiring any digestive process. It comes in an oral preparation. But, it tastes terrible. The way to make it palatable is to mix it with jello and add unsweetened Kool-Aid as flavoring. The MCT oil is most frequently used for premature babies. It is a medium-chain triglyceride which is an essential fat. It 2. Is directly absorbed without needing digestion. When I was in medical practice I saved many patients' lives by using these two simple remedies. I have also found that demons love to create very painful paresthesias. Paresthesias are severe burning pains on various areas of the skin, sometimes accompanied by intense itching. Usually there is nothing abnormal about the appearance of the skin, but it will be very tender to the touch and extremely painful. In these cases, if anointing with oil does not stop the pain, I have found that often injectable vitamin B12 in large doses over 7 to 10 days is helpful. One of the very few uses I ever found for B12, usually, in amounts of 1000 mcg per injection per day. When anointing with oil, it is important that the entire area that is painful be covered with the oil. Shingles is also common with demonic affliction. Anytime anyone has repeated bouts of shingles, they should immediately go to the Lord to see if the source is demonic. Painful joints are another common demonic problem. Sometimes the joint will be swollen or appear inflamed, but usually it will appear completely normal. Again, usually covering the entire joint with oil and commanding the demons to leave is all that is needed. However, if that doesn't completely handle the problem, and a physical problem such as an infection, 
cartilage problem, etc. is not present. A mixture of DMSO with 10% hydrocortisone is very effective. DMSO was finally approved by the FDA in 1988. It is available with a prescription. Use a cotton ball to gently pat on the solution three or four times per day. Usually the pain and or inflammation will subside after one or two days. You should not use the solution more than one week, however. I know that most of these things need prescriptions, but I write them here in hopes that the people who need them will be able to find a doctor somewhere to help them get what they need. There are essentially no side effects to any of these, so none of them are dangerous to use. One last word to physicians. We must realize that demons are experts in handling viruses and bacteria. These infections are difficult to treat. The most common treatment error I came across while I was in practice was the use of too small a dose of antibiotics. Talk to your patients and pray with them. If you feel a patient is being afflicted by witchcraft, treat as her infection aggressively. Anything less than 500 mg per dose of most any oral antibiotic in adults is too little in these cases. I would frequently use a gram per dose for the first 24 to 48 hours. I found through practical experience that this made the difference between handling an infection quickly and effectively and having to deal with a prolonged and complicated course or a low-level smoldering infection which is most bothersome. Always be sure to anoint with oil and command the interfering demons to leave in the name of Jesus. Demons are experts at hindering the body's attempts to fight infection. If a person has a pre-existing weakness or tendency to a particular illness, the demons will always strike in that area. For instance, if a person has a seizure disorder, then the demons will try to give them seizures. If they have had kidney stones, that is where the demons will strike. It is easier for demons to create illness where there has been illness before. The same is true for those coming out of the craft. Usually the demons will strike in the same way they did to discipline while the person was in the craft. We need to be careful to pray for special shielding in such areas. One last area that needs to be addressed is the problem of cancer. Demons are expert at causing cancer. However, I have seen too many people terribly disappointed when they have been promised healing from cancer by deliverance. This is just not so. I want to emphasize again that when demons start a physical process such as cancer, casting out the demon will not put a stop to the cancer. The process has already been set in motion. The only way the cancer can be healed is if it can be totally removed surgically, treated by radiation or chemotherapy, although few courses of chemotherapy are truly effective in bringing about cures, or if the Lord chooses to do a miracle and heal the person directly. These are all things that have been revealed to myself and others by the Holy Spirit. All physicians should be much in prayer seeking guidance on how to treat their patients, especially those afflicted with demonic illnesses. Our Lord is so very gracious. I have been privileged to see many, many miraculous healings. But the problem of demonically created wounds and illnesses is a very real one which will, I believe, become more and more common as we get closer to the end. Evil is escalating at an amazing rate. Jesus himself prophesied that the evil in the last days prior to his return would be worse than it ever has been on the earth except in days of Noah. I firmly believe we are living in those days. We as Christians, and especially as Christian physicians, are going to see things stranger than fiction as Satan's kingdom grows in power and strength. We must walk closely with the Lord because we are entering days when only the guidance of the Holy Spirit will keep us alive. Chapter 7 The Holy Spirit Versus Demon Spirit Guides I believe it is very important for those people coming out of the occult to gain a good understanding of the operation of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They are used to having one or more demon spirit guides. Once they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are given the Holy Spirit to help and guide them. However, the Holy Spirit functions very differently from a demon spirit guide. Christians who have never been involved in the occult need to know how demon spirits act as spirit guides. Why? Because the sad truth is that many Christians today are accepting a demon spirit guide thinking it is the Holy Spirit. Most of these errors could be avoided if Christians had a good basic understanding of how Scripture describes the functions of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The following shows comparisons between the Holy Spirit and Demon Spirit Guides. 1. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty with unlimited power and knowledge. He has all the attributes of the Godhead. 
Demon spirits are limited created beings. They have none of the attributes of the Godhead. Their knowledge and intelligence, though far superior to human intelligence, is limited. 2. The Holy Spirit values our individuality. He does not try to usurp our individual personality in any way. Demons hate human beings. They try to usurp the individual's personality and replace it with their own. 3. The Holy Spirit wants us to be in control and responsible for our own actions. He works in us to will and to do His good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 Demons want total control. They will frequently knock the person unconscious and then use them in any way they want. 4. The Holy Spirit is gentle. When He comes into a person, He is so gentle that when you look inside yourself, you can't tell what is the Holy Spirit and what is you. Demons are harsh. Because of their desire to take over, a person can always sense a difference between the demon spirit and themselves. This is true even if they think the demon is a counselor of part of their own subconscious mind. It is always an entity separate from their conscious mind. 5. The Holy Spirit is holy and pure. He brings purity into our lives. He gives us power to overcome sin. Demons are totally corrupt. They will always lead a person deeper and deeper into sin. Even the demons in the New Age movement who try to present themselves as being good quickly lead the person into sin. Within the New Age movement, the areas of sin to show quickly are sexual immorality and a desire to delve into the occult and increase contact with the spirit world. 6. The Holy Spirit always uplifts and glorifies Jesus, thereby bringing humility into the life of the person he indwells. Demons hate Jesus. They glorify the person in whom they dwell always drawing attention to the person himself instead of toward Jesus. Pride is the hallmark of demons and the people they inhabit. 7. The Holy Spirit never blanks out our minds. He puts thoughts into our minds, but does not blank them. He wants us to bring into captivity every thought. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and to willing to do his good pleasure. Philippians 2 13, he always wants us to actively cooperate with him. We do not have to blank our minds for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. He is so powerful that He can overwrite our active mind at any time. This is the place where most Christians make mistakes and fall into deception, thinking they have to blank their minds for the Holy Spirit to operate through them or speak to them. Demons frequently blank out a person's mind. They function best when the person passively lets them take over. That's why Eastern and Occultic. Meditation always involves relaxation techniques to blank the mind. Demons have difficulty overriding an active strong mind. They always encourage periods of mental passivity. 8. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. But his conviction is non-destructive. He always leads the person to repentance, forgiveness, redemption, and peace. Demons do one of two things. They help the person justify his sins or they bring destructive crushing guilt with no hope of forgiveness or redemption. Demonic guilt always brings with it the message, you cannot be forgiven. 9. The Holy Spirit will never give us any communication that contradicts God's word. Demons will twist and turn God's word and take it out of context to justify sin. 10. We can never control the Holy Spirit. He functions when and how he pleases. We are the servants. He is the master. Example. We cannot control when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, gives us a glimpse of the spirit world, makes us aware of God's presence, heals, or gives us discernment. The Holy Spirit never does the same thing twice. He refuses to allow us to depend on any routine or ritual. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, lists various gifts. But all these gifts, Worketh at one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. 1. Corinthians 12, 6 7, 11. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Hebrews 2, 4. Demon spirits dupe the people they indwell into thinking they can control them. They will come whenever the person calls, heal when the person wants, etc. They love rituals and routines. They enable a person to see the spirit world more and more. The demonic counterfeits of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are usually under the control of the person, that is he can heal, prophesy, have words of knowledge, etc., whenever he wants. 
11. The Holy Spirit demands that we walk in faith, not by sight or emotions. Therefore, He does not frequently or routinely give us visions or emotions. The Holy Spirit does not satisfy carnal desires for emotional rewards. Because we must walk by faith and not by sight, the Holy Spirit rarely lets us see the spirit world, and certainly not on a routine basis, or when we want to. Demons love to manipulate human emotions. They control many by giving them emotional highs or rewards. Demons also love to give humans emotional extremes. Demons frequently help people see the spirit world, thus decreasing their need for faith. People with demon spirit guides frequently have visions and supernatural experiences. 12. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by disobeying Him. When we disobey Him, He withdraws and does not function in our lives. The Holy Spirit never goes against our free will. God doesn't want puppets or robots. Demons bring quick punishment to anyone disobeying them. They are quick to take over and control, always trying to usurp the person's free will. Demons love puppets and robots. 13. The Holy Spirit loves us and brings us into eternal life in the presence of God. Demons hate us and lead people into eternal destruction separated from God forever in hell. 14. Jesus loved us enough to die for, and shed his own blood for us, paying the price for our purification from sins himself. Demons never shed any of their blood for people. They are always demanding that people shed blood for them teaching the people that they must do this for their purification so that Satan and the demons can bless them. Or, in the case of Christians, demons bring about all sorts of self-imposed punishment and or rigid legalistic rules so that God can bless them. 15. Jesus paid the price for our sins once and for all. See 1 Peter 3 18, demons always demand more and more sacrifices. They are never satisfied. 16. The Holy Spirit gives the desire to read the Bible. Demons try to keep people from reading the Bible. 17. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand the scriptures. See John 14 26. Demons bring confusion. They block a person from understanding the scriptures. God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14 33. 18. The Holy Spirit draws us to pray. Demons hinder all true prayer. 19. The Holy Spirit is not a show-off. Demons love to make a show. 20. When the Holy Spirit transports a Christian in spirit he takes good care of the physical body. See Revelation 4, 1-2, 2 Corinthians 12, 2-3, etc. When a person astral projects, the demon spirit left in his physical body to maintain it, could care less about that person's body. That's why astral projection creates such a terrible physical drain on the person doing it. The hair of most people doing astral projection turns gray quickly. 21. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. He never lies. All demons are liars, so are the people they indwell. 22. The Holy Spirit demands that we actively use our minds to learn. He is never willing to serve as an information bank independent from our minds. Demon spirit guides are quite willing to serve as an information bank so that the person they indwell does not need to actually learn the information with their minds. Therefore, when a person accepts Jesus and kicks out as her spirit guide, whatever information they allow to reside in their spirit guide is immediately and forever lost. Far too many Christians make the fatal error of thinking the 23. Holy Spirit will come and take control of them so that they do not know what they are doing, or so that they do not control themselves. Only demons do this. The Holy Spirit always demands our active conscious cooperation with His will. Anytime we give up the control of ourselves, we have opened the door for demons to come in and control us. Demons love to take over and control the people they indwell. 24. The Holy Spirit is not a fortune teller. Neither does He give us divination ability. See Matthew 6:34. One of the most common deceptions of demon spirit guides is to give the person many false words of knowledge which is really simple divination. Demons also give many individual prophecies which is really fortune telling. Prophecy in the scriptures is usually for the whole body of Christ, rarely for individuals, and certainly not on a frequent basis. Chapter 8. The Sin Nature. As I travel about the country and around the world. I find that Christians everywhere seem to lack a good understanding of what I call our sin nature. This spiritual warfare in which we are involved is very real, 
but we must face up to our own responsibility before God. We cannot blame all of our sins on Satan or the demons. We are fully responsible before God to control ourselves and stop sinning. I believe that when Adam fell into sin, all of his offspring inherited that fallen nature from him. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5:12. Therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of the one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Romans 5 18 19. Exactly what is this sin nature? It is the almost continual desire to sin that saturates every part of us. Andrew Murray describes it like this. The whole power of sin working in us is nothing but this, that as we inherit Adam's fallen nature, we inherit this tendency to disobedience. By our own choice we become the children of disobedience, clearly, the one work Christ was needed for was to remove this disobedience, its curse, its dominion, its evil nature and workings. Disobedience was the root of all sin and misery. The first object of his salvation was to cut away the evil root and restore man to his original destiny, a life in obedience to his God. The Believer's Secret of Obedience, by Andrew Murray, Bethany House Publishers, page 25, Paul described it as follows. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Romans 7 19 23, clearly, the desire to sin is present even at the same time as the mind desires to obey God. Sin is an integral part of us. That is why I call it our sin nature. Scripture refers to this sin nature in different ways. Sometimes it is called our old man. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 6, 6. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, Colossians 3, 8-10. Sometimes scripture calls this sin nature our flesh, or our carnal nature. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 4. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, 2 8. Sin is woven through our very being, body, soul, and spirit. Here are some scriptures that clearly show us the extent to which sin has taken us over. Body. O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of this death? Romans 7 24. Soul. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? I the Lord search the heart, I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings, Jeremiah 17, 9-10. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, Romans 8, 7, Spirit. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, James 4, 5. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And finally, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
1 Thessalonians 5.23. These scriptures clearly show that all three areas of us, body, soul, and spirit, are affected by sin. All three areas must be cleansed by our Lord Jesus Christ. But we deal with sin on a day-to-day -day basis mostly within our conscious mind. I don't think we will ever have a full understanding of the terrible downdrag this sin nature has been on us until we receive our glorified bodies and are set free from sin forever. Yes, demons tempt us to sin, but, ultimately, the decision is ours. We choose to sin. Therefore, whether the demons are inside of us or afflicting us from the outside, we are squarely responsible before God for everything we do. You may be sure the demons understand our sin nature through and through. That is why they can manipulate us so well. The whole Bible is full of verses strongly urging us to battle against our natural desire to do those things which are wrong. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Hebrews 12, 1. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, Hebrews 12, 3-4. Have you ever stopped to wonder why scripture has so much in it commanding us to stop sinning? Well, for one thing, God is completely holy and just. He cannot allow sin to remain. That is why Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sins so that God would not have to give us the just punishment and destruction we deserve for our sins. The ultimate punishment for sin is to be banished from God's presence forever. However, too many people fall into the trap of thinking that once we are saved our sins are not so important. Paul addressed this issue very plainly. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Romans 6, 1-2 the real reason why it is so important for us to put sin out of our lives is because sin separates us from God. Do you want more abundance in your life? Then put sin out of your life. Furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, For it is the will of God, even your sanctification, to be set apart for God to separate from sin and the world, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, you, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, personal desires, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Thessalonians 4, 3-5, Scripture is clear. The only way to have a close relationship with God and to live a life of abundance in Christ Jesus, is to stop sinning. In fact, there is a very unpopular concept that we must think about very soberly. We must prove ourselves to God. We must demonstrate obedience and faith. Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Can we do any less? Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrew 5, 8-9. The hard facts are this. We cannot progress in our growth in the Lord without first proving ourselves obedient and faithful by putting sin out of our lives. This is one of the gravest errors in the current teachings about the Holy Spirit. Too many people promise instant access to great power in Christ. We receive this type of power only as we prove ourselves faithful. I find that amazing, actually, the amount of power God does give to new Christians. But, we cannot sidestep the growing and refining process. This process will continue as long as we live, but we will reach a point where much of it is behind us. The parable of the man who went to a far country to be crowned king applies here. Let's look at it. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom, and to return. And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him, and sent a message after him, saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass, that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded his servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then, came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, 
because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin, for I fear thee, because thou art an austere man, thou tackest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow, wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds, for I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither, and slay them before me. Luke 19 12 27, in this parable, the man who went to be crowned king is Jesus. We are his servants left behind waiting for him to come back. Now the question is this. Are we going to be faithful and profitable servants for our king? It is only as we prove ourselves faithful that we are given more power and authority in Christ. Far too many Christians think only about what benefits they can get from God. They never stop to think that they are here to be servants. The Lord Jesus makes it very clear that the servants must prove themselves before they are given more power and authority. The same is true today. Unfortunately, too much of modern day teaching tries to sidestep this testing and growing time. We must not try to avoid the painful learning process. Every servant of God in the pages of scripture went through this process. I am convinced that this is the reason why so many in leadership fall. They were thrust into positions of leadership too fast. That is why Paul wrote to Timothy as he did. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. 1 Timothy 5:22. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. Not a novice, new Christian, lest being lifted up with pride fall into the condemnation of the devil. 1 Timothy 3, 2, 6. Likewise must the deacons be grave. And let these also first be proved. Tested, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. 1. Timothy 3, 8, 10. Scripture could not be more clear. Anyone who would come into a position of any authority in God's kingdom must first prove himself or herself faithful in obeying God and putting sin out of their lives. This takes time. Scripture does not specify how much time, it is different with each person but it does take some time. In my own life I went through five years of fiery trials before the Lord called me to start into this ministry, and then I went through another five years of even more intense testing before my first book was published. That makes ten years in all of intense preparation and testing. I had to prove myself faithful and obedient. I am thankful for that testing time because it has given me a deep stability in the Lord I could not have obtained in any other way. Our authority over Satan's kingdom increases as we prove ourselves steadfast and faithful. We must be faithful in little before we can be faithful in much. I believe every new believer is given authority in Christ over the demons inside of himself, but he should not jump into trying to deal with demons in others. He has not yet had time to grow or prove himself. My heart grieves as I see this happening to those coming out of Satanism. All too often they are thrust into a position of publicly giving their testimony etc. Pride crouches at the door. They come under such terrible attack that they cannot stand. My advice is this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. James 4:10. Walk quietly before the Lord and learn the lessons he wants you to learn. Prove yourself faithful and obedient. No matter how great the temptation, never allow a new Christian to be put in a place of public prominence. You'll contribute to his her destruction if you do. Our Lord is so gracious. He allows us to do some work for Him, especially in sharing the gospel, even as we are babes in Christ first learning to walk. He does this to encourage us. But we must be willing to go through the training and proving process. If we are not, then He can never fully use us as He wants. We can effectively teach only those lessons we have ourselves learned. 
You will not grow or prove yourself as long as you continue to allow active sin in your life. God so intensely desired us to be cleansed from sin that he gave his very own life to provide for our purification. We must also so intensely desire to be free from sin that we are willing to lay down anything, no matter how painful it may be, to put sin out of our lives. Okay, so we know we must stop sinning. But we are still left with the terrible struggle Paul described, quoted earlier in this chapter, in Romans chapter 7. How then can we have victory in this struggle against our sin nature? The answer is simple. We must have more power than our sin nature has, or we can never overcome it. Where do we get such power? I believe the answer is in the following scriptures. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after flesh but after the Spirit, Holy Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 1-2. Jesus set us free from the power of sin when he died on the cross. Once we receive him as our Lord and Savior and Master, that power is available to us. We have not yet received everything God has promised to give us. In the future, at the return of Christ, each one of us will receive the rest of what God promised us in our redemption. We will receive a new and glorified physical body exactly the same as the one Jesus now has, and, best of all, our sin nature will be wiped away so we will never have to struggle with it again. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is, able even to subdue all things unto himself. Philippians 3 20 21, this is our bright hope. One day, we will never again have the desire to sin and we will be continually in the presence of the Lord and know Him face to face. How I look forward to that day! But, in the meantime, we must fight the battle against sin. The way to victory over sin in our lives is really twofold. The first and most important way to victory is through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The second is given to use in Romans. I want to deal with the second part of the answer first. For they that are after the flesh, sinful desires, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Romans 8, 5. Simply put, the more time we spend every day reading the Bible, thinking about God's Word, the Bible, and thinking about God, the more victory we will have over our sin nature. King David learned this lesson even as did Joshua before him. Wherewithal shall a young man, or woman, cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Memorize, that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 9-11, God commanded Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1, 8. You know, there is one thing about the Bible that makes it different from every other book in the world. It is literally alive. It is alive because it is God speaking to us. For the word of God is quick, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 12. No other book or printed page in the whole world has the unique power of the Bible. The more we saturate our entire lives and minds with the scripture, the more power we will have to live in obedience to it, thereby putting sin out of our lives. However, we must study the Bible to obey it. If you accustom yourself to study the Bible without an earnest and very definite purpose to obey, you're getting hardened in disobedience. Never read God's word concerning you without honestly yielding yourself to obey it at once and asking grace to do so. God has given us his word to tell us what he wants us to do, and to show the grace he has provided to enable us to do it. How sad to think it a pious thing just to read that word without any earnest effort to obey it. May God keep us from this terrible sin. Let us make it a sacred habit to say to God, Lord, whatever I know to be your will, I will at once obey, always read with a heart yielded up in willing obedience, The Believer's Secret of Obedience, by Andrew Murray, Bethany House Publishers, page 46. Have you ever noticed just how difficult it is to pick up the Bible and read it if you have let several days go by without reading it? Oh how quickly our sin nature gains strength if we do not keep it under control. 
The Apostle Paul made a profound statement about this after many years in the ministry. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1. Corinthians 9:27. I am so thankful the Holy Spirit had Paul write that statement. It has been very helpful to me to know that even the Apostle Paul had a struggle against his sin nature all of his life. Here's a little test for you. How many times in a day do you think about God or think about Scripture, or talk to God? How often do you stop to compare what is happening to you, or what you are doing, to Scripture? You should be doing this almost continually. If you will do this, you will find that your entire life will change. There is such a purity in the Scriptures. As I work with people coming out of Satanism, I hear and see such terrible things. The sin and perversions in these people's lives are incredible. I find that I have to continually turn my mind back onto Scripture, and that as I do, God's Word brings a wonderful purity into my mind. Those of us who have been called by God to work in areas where we must deal with people involved in terrible perversions, must be very careful to continually wash our minds with God's Word. If we do not, we will be quick to fall. Taking control of your mind is a real key to having victory over sin. That's the meaning of that scripture in Romans 8, 5. The more we have our mind on the things of God, the less we will sin. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2. Corinthians 10, 5. It should be normal that a Christian should live so that he sins very rarely. This is why the Apostle John wrote as he did. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Comma 1 John 2, 1. If you have not done so, may I recommend that you carefully read the chapter entitled A Double-Minded Man in my second book Prepare for War on the subject of taking every thought captive. We cannot have victory over sin in our lives unless we discipline our minds and take every thought captive to make them obedient to Christ. However, saturating your life with God's Word, helpful and necessary as this is, is not, in itself, the complete answer. We must also have power. That power comes to us from the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. John 16, 7. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2 13. It is only with the help of the Holy Spirit that we can overcome our sin nature and stop sinning. Remember I just told you there were two parts to the answer of how to control our sin nature? Controlling our thoughts and saturating our minds with God's Word is the first part, and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit is the second part. We must have both equally. The longer I live in this walk with my master, the more aware I become of my own utter helplessness to cope with or stop the sin in my life. But, praise God, the power of the Holy Spirit enables me to have the victory. Look at John 16, 7 quoted above. When Jesus was here on earth in bodily form, his disciples followed him faithfully and Jesus ministered to each one of them every day. But they fell again and again. Why? Because no matter how faithful or diligent they were, they did not have power inside of them over their sin natures. Thus, even though they were in the very presence of God himself, they fell into unbelief and sin, time and time again. That is why it was necessary for Jesus to leave earth. Once Jesus was no longer on earth in bodily form, he could send the Holy Spirit to work in his disciples from the inside. Jesus made this possible by paying the price for our sins on the cross. When we are washed clean from our sins, then God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit can enter into us and bring the power we need to overcome sin. If you have never gotten down on your knees and asked Father to completely fill you with his Holy Spirit to give you power to stop sinning, you need to do so. But, it is a two-way street. The more you saturate your mind with God's word and put sin out of your life, the more freedom the Holy Spirit has to operate in your life with power. Please don't fall into the trap of thinking that all you need is the Holy Spirit, that you don't need to do anything yourself. This just isn't true. James sums it all up very simply. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, excess, of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted, planted, word, which is able to save your souls.
but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway, immediately, forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the Bible, and continueth therein, lives in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1 21 25, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe, and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? James 2 17 20, we have, today, far too often fallen into the trap of looking only for signs and miracles. That is why there are so many books on Christian bookshelves on such things as how to heal, how to perform miracles, etc. God is much more interested in our daily obedience and faithful walk than he is in performing miracles and signs and wonders. All too often Christians of today are falling into deception and accepting demonic counterfeits as being signs and miracles from God. You cannot have true signs and wonders from the Holy Spirit in your life without walking a walk of obedience and discipline, putting sin out of your life. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful help to us in fighting against sin. Ask the Lord to quicken to you those scripture verses that particularly apply to sins you commonly commit. Then memorize those verses and ask the Holy Spirit to flash them into your mind when you are about to commit a sin. The Holy Spirit knows everything we do before we do it. He monitors everything we do. He can help us to stop sinning. Let me give you an example from my own life. A couple of years ago two young women came to live with Elaine and me for a few months. They were called by God to help us in our ministry, but they were unwilling for the rigid discipline necessary in our lives. They ended up turning against me, and ended up spreading lies about me to other people who knew me. I was becoming rather angry about the whole situation. One weekend during my quiet time with the Lord, I started reading the letters written by Peter. I reached 1 Peter 2 21 23. As I read those verses, the Holy Spirit spoke to me very plainly. Memorize those verses, he said. And every time you are about to sin in this matter, I will bring them back to your conscious mind. Here are the verses I memorized, for even he run to where you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, slandered, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 1 Peter 2 21 23. You see, this scripture told me that even though those two were telling all sorts of lies about me that I was not to defend myself, but forgive them and commit the whole matter into the Lord's hands. Well, I asked them to move out, but the Lord completely blocked them from doing so for three very long months. Do you have any idea just how many times the Holy Spirit had to flash those verses into my mind during those three months? But, having those verses flashed into my mind kept me from sinning in the situation. Praise God. The Holy Spirit will be a great help to you if you will only obey Him. There is a very important principle I want to give you. The root of all sin is self-centeredness. Oh how we love to think about ourselves. The root of all mental illness is the sin of self-centeredness. The mark of someone who is mentally ill or has a lot of problems in their life is that they refuse to think about anything or anyone but themselves. Notice that I said they refuse rather than they are incapable of Mentally ill people choose to be mentally ill, for the most part. Oh, they use the excuse of past rejections and hurts. But stop to think for a minute. Has anyone suffered more rejection and hurt than Jesus? No. What a terrible fix we would be in if Jesus chose to spend his time in self-pity, dwelling on and reacting to the hurt and rejection he suffered. Most people, whether they are classified as mentally ill or not, spend the bulk of their time thinking about themselves. This is especially true of people with what is called an inferiority complex, I should know, I was guilty of this sin for a number of years. It was one of the first things the Holy Spirit demanded I deal with after I had made Jesus the total master in my life. I had experienced much rejection as a child growing up. As a result, 
I thought I was worthless, ugly, and repulsive to other people. I had such an inferiority complex that I would never go into even a fast food restaurant by myself to eat. I didn't want people looking at me. I will never forget the evening shortly after I had made Jesus the total master in my life when the Holy Spirit dealt with me on the problem. I was starting to drive through a drive-up window at McDonald's when the Lord spoke to me with profound clarity and force. No, you will go inside and sit down at a table and eat. But Lord, I replied, you know I can't stand doing that. What will all those people think of me eating alone? The Lord's answer was swift, clear, and to the point. That's just the problem. You never think about anything but yourself. You must confess your inferiority complex as sin. It is the sin of self-centeredness. The fact is that you aren't important enough for other people to bother with you at all. They are all thinking about themselves. I was shocked. But I knew immediately that what the Holy Spirit said was true. Paranoia, inferiority complexes, people reacting because of past rejection in their life, are all the sin of self-centeredness. It's time we stop thinking about ourselves all the time and became the servants of our King that we should be. Has someone hurt you? Then, before God, you are required to forgive him. Do you know what it means to forgive? Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged, condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned, forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Comma Luke 6 36 37. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, be put away from you, with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Comma Ephesians 4 30 32 If we refuse to forgive those who have hurt us, we grieve the Holy Spirit so that he cannot work in our lives. Most people coming out of Satanism have been horribly abused while in the craft. This is especially true of those who were raised by parents who were Satanists, or who were recruited into the craft while very young. The abuses these people suffer are beyond anything most people can imagine. However, God's word applies to them and to you the same as to those of us who have not been abused in this way. They must forgive those who have hurt them so that Father can forgive them of their own sins. There are four basic steps in this matter of forgiving someone who has hurt you. 1. We do not forgive because we feel like it. We forgive as a pure act of our will and obedience to God's command. 2. When we forgive someone, we acknowledge that we no longer have any right to revenge on that person. For we know him, God, that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10 30 31 Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use, mistreat. You. Luke 6 28. 3. When we forgive someone, we must do so following God's example. Once we have forgiven someone, we no longer have any right to allow the memories or thoughts of what they have done to hurt us, to stay in our minds. We must discipline our minds and stop thinking about ourselves. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 8 12. 4. Once we have taken these steps in obedience to God, we can ask Father to control and change our emotions in the situation. We human beings can do very little to control or change our emotions. But the Lord can and will, as we obey Him and forgive those who have hurt us. Too often, Christians completely sidestep the whole issue of forgiving by repressing their emotions. We know that we should not be bitter or angry when someone does something against us. It is much easier to push the unacceptable emotions out of our conscious minds than to deal with the necessary forgiveness or confrontation in the situation. If a brother or sister sins against us we are not only commanded to forgive him her, we are also commanded to talk to them and show them their sin. Then, whether they repent or not, we are required to forgive them. Repressing the anger and hurt is one way of avoiding the whole situation. This is not God's will. He always demands honesty. As we forgive someone, we must also truthfully talk to the Lord, recognizing and admitting our true emotions in the situation. As we do this, we then have the right to ask the Lord to heal and change our emotions. He will do so as we walk in obedience to Him. 
I know I will make many of you reading this passage very angry, but I must tell you as the Lord taught me. You do not have the right to live your life reacting to past hurts. God demands that you forgive and forget and stop thinking about yourself and how you have been hurt. If you do not do so, you are living in active sin. Lastly, we must all come to a maturity in Christ where we make James 4.17 a reality in our lives. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4.17 To put this in very simple terms, we must do the right thing simply because it is the right thing to do, not because someone else demands it of us. If we would only reach this point, so many, many interpersonal relationship problems would simply disappear. Here in the United States, the Lord has very graciously given us a simple tool in just about every household to help teach us this principle. It looks like this, figure 8-1. Figure 8-1. When we don't obey this principle of James 4-17, it then looks like this, figure 8-2. Figure 8-2. Come on now, be honest. How many times have you had a fight with someone over whose turn it was to take out the trash? God's word says that when we know the right thing to do and don't do it, we are sinning. If you see that the trash can is full, you know the right thing to do is empty it. And when you empty it, you don't go to your parent or spouse and say something like, Honey, I emptied the trash for you. No you didn't. You are looking for a pat on the back. You should have emptied it simply because it was the right thing to do. You see, when you do things just because someone else expects you to, you, will have a lot of anger towards the other person. I have to do so and so because my wife expects it, or, I have to do so and so or my mom will get mad. How many times have you heard such statements? The sad thing is, we treat God in the same way. We become angry at God because we feel we have to do certain things because the Lord demands it. Not doing the right thing is sin. I believe greater than 75% of all the problems amongst church members would be solved if people would grow up and begin to operate as this one scripture tells us. Do the right thing. I never cease to be amazed at how people can walk right past something that they can see needs to be done, and simply not do it. This is a mark of immaturity. It is because of this attitude in our lives that the Lord must chastise us so often. That's where the trouble starts in our relationship with Him. I well remember one day when I was driving to work when the Lord spoke to me and told me that I must begin to bring some discipline into the lives of two young women who had come to live in my home about a month previously. I had been through the cycle many times, and I was tired and didn't want the hassle. I said, Oh Father, I just don't think it is worth the hassle. Whenever I try to do such a thing people try to send me on such guilt trips. They say things like Who do you think you are? Who made you God? The Lord's answer was clear and forceful. Child, would you like a precise accounting of the number of times you have tried to send Emmy on guilt trips? For example Father, if you loved me, how could you let this happen to me? Needless to say, I did not want such an accounting. How many times have you tried to send God on guilt trips? God if you loved me how could you let this happen to me? God if you loved me you would give me so and so. How can a loving God allow such and such to happen? All such questions are sin. And a mark of our terrible immaturity. It is time we Christians grew up. Paul said. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13 11. We must put all such childish things behind us. Let us face up to our responsibilities and commitments and fulfill them in righteousness before God. Let us fight this fight against our sin natures and win. This is the way to an abundant life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If the reader is convicted by this chapter to rise up and take control of his her sin nature, a good place to start is by a thorough confession of all your past sins to God. Please see Appendix A for some helpful notes on how to approach such a confession. This is the end of Part 1 of Becoming a Vessel of Honor. Please listen to Part 2 of Becoming a Vessel of Honor and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. The Watchman.